Ever wonder what smoking grass feels like? Well, this video will go over literally everything there is to know. Oh, and YouTube, here's proof that they're my videos. Anyway, let's start it off with the holiest of highs, the wake and bake. One who does not understand the true implications of this act may find himself overwhelmed by its powers. Yet this holy practice has a special place in every stoner's heart, for it can only be truly enjoyed if one forfeits his entire life energy and hopes to receive the blessing of the Za gods. For if one does not concede to the Za, Dai will be consumed by it. I have witnessed one too many proud ignorant soldiers underestimate the wake and bake and end up overwhelmed by its mighty force. But if you're confused by my holy transcript, I'll put it in terms you might understand better. It's not a wake and bake if you don't fucking wake up. Dudes be out here talking about, ooh, I love waking and baking. It makes my whole day so much less stressful. Yeah, of course it does, Dingle Bob. If all you do after is watch TikTok, order Uber Eats, fill your belly to the brim, and take a free hour nap. But some of us still disrespect the holy practice by literally doing nothing with the extravagant mega high of the wake and bake. And yes, no matter what science says, I'm here to tell you getting high as soon as you wake up is a lot stronger and different than getting high, let's say, in the evening. And my theory is that right after waking up, your body and brain are not functioning at full capacity yet and are weak against foreign substance attacks like THC. So when you inhale that beautiful Mary Jane right after waking up, your body's defense systems are down, leading to more of the THC slipping through to your brain, therefore getting suited as fuck. And since design nothing but an amplifier of your senses feelings and thoughts since waking up is hard to begin with because i don't know about you but i personally gotta recite every damn inspirational rocky balboa quote to muster up the strength to get up in the morning if you're high that shit is like 10 times harder and that's proven by most of these mofos who claim they like waking and baking dudes get high and just stare at the wall and watch the day go by like there really are levels to this shit and since your boy waked and baked every single day for a whole summer i have gone through all of them and am qualified to tell you it starts at level one the couch potato. This is the state you're probably gonna be in for the first couple times you get high right in the morning. And it ain't nothing to be ashamed of because those first times are like a learning experience. Once the baking is planned, when you go to sleep, it'll have you all excited like, oh boy, can't wait to get high as soon as I wake up and go on an adventure. But when the time comes and you smoke that exotic, you soon realize that this shit hits different. Not only are you baked out of your mind, you also feel like your eyelids have 10 pound weights on them. But even so, you will try your best to go on that high adventure you have been hyping up. But unfortunately, the most you can do is gather the strength to go to the kitchen and make a sandwich. Which after, you'll probably take that right back to your room, put on some Netflix or some, watch it for a couple minutes and realize... Ugh. I'm not leaving this bed anytime soon, am I? And boom! You either fall asleep or lie in your bed watching Netflix like the potato you are for the whole high. But if you're like me and don't accept that as a successful and fun wake and bake, you'll do it again some other day and this time you're better educated on the powers of the morning za, which will lead you to level 2. I will persevere. This time, you know what to expect and have mentally prepared for the tiredness and overall lack of motivation to do stuff by the wake and bake. So just like before, you decide to try the holy practice, but this time decide to brush your teeth and maybe take a shower before the bake. Just cause you know one of the hardest parts about getting up in the morning is the fact you can't just stand up and start your day. You gotta do your morning routine first. Anyway, now that you've completed the wake and bake and were smart enough to do a bit of your morning routine first, the 10 pound weights that were attached to your eyelids previously have now lightened up to about mm, 4 pound weights. And although every fiber of your being is still telling you to go lie down, you fight through and attempt to start your day with something lightly productive like going to the store or cleaning your room. And if you do end up going to the store like I did, well I'm sorry to tell you but it's a trap. Because you will most likely find yourself admiring every food item your eyeballs gaze upon and we all know when the munchies hit, well, you either rise to the occasion or you have a bad trip. Hey, I'm sorry, I don't make the rules, I just follow them. So you go back home, do your best impression of Nikocado Avocado and find yourself watching YouTube or Netflix on your wretched bed again. Good try, but not quite the wake and bake epic adventure you were hoping for. But this time, you swear on your mama. Well, better not do that, but anyway, you swear that next time you will have an awesome wake and bake, which will lead you to level 3. It's not about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. You 
You've had enough of this BS. You're done folding to the power of the Tsar and being that 1990s generic movie stoner who smokes grass, plays video games and eats Doritos all day. So now, you do what you did previously, but instead of going to your local Wonderland 7-Eleven, you instead go to the gym or just do something productive that doesn't involve binge watching the new One Piece Netflix series. But this level is in reality quite subjective. It all depends on what your idea of a successful wake and bake is. For me, I'm happy with my wake and bake if after the high dissipates and reality starts to shape back in, I don't feel all hazy and sad from the fact that I did a wake and bake. This also means sometimes it's okay to hit that Mary Jane immediately after waking and just playing video games the entire time. If you plan a day like that ahead and enter the morning with no desire to do anything but lay on your couch and eat 50% off birthday cakes you got from the discount aisle at Walmart, then that's fine. One of my funnest and favorite high memories came from a wake and bake with Riz X, where immediately after waking we spontaneously decided to get faded and after that we were a bit bored so we decided to look at how much money we had in our bank balance and well things weren't looking too good but we were able to scrape together $200 and went on Facebook marketplace to search for fun items for the high mind. And oh boy we sure did strike gold because we found this guy selling an Xbox Series S with two controllers close to our area. So we pulled up, acquired the box, found a free trial for Xbox Game Pass and played a bunch of split screen games and ate McNuggets all goddamn day. Which in my book has got to be a successful wake and bake but it would have been an awful one if we hadn't planned ahead and occupied the day schedule with only two things in mind. Smoke grass and have fun. But one thing I will say about the holy practice known as the wake and bake is that it's best enjoyed as a special occasion and that's because them shits absolutely demolish your tolerance and I speak from experience. We went from a bag lasting one week to one day and three days of waking and baking. Like I don't know exactly why but that shit sure isn't sustainable financially nor productivity wise. It also has to do with the fact when you wake and bake you usually smoke throughout the whole day but when you smoke up after a long and productive day of grinding you only do so once or twice before you get tired and go to bed giving your body ample time to recover from the THC. Think about it like this if you wake and bake and then smoke throughout the day that ganja is constantly building up so your body never really has time to digest that THC through your system but if you smoke only every 24 hours or so you're giving your body time to recover and remove the za from your brain making it so you don't have to smoke a whole spliff just to feel a little bit high but shit I'm not a scientist so all this stuff might be BS but I don't know it kind of makes sense doesn't it smoking alone it's a lot different than smoking with a group because well you're alone so it's exclusively your job to explore those high thoughts and piece together fun activities to enjoy the high and if all goes well you'll have a blast scrolling shorts playing games watching movies pondering the scale of the universe and how nothing actually matters it's great but it comes with a catch you see when you're with a group of friends it's much easier to stay on subject and destroy the evil thoughts the grass might curse you with so in my experience when I'm getting high alone I usually smoke a bit less just cuz being super mega high is 99% of the time best enjoyed with a group and not by yourself unfortunately when I was a youngster I hadn't discovered this in fact I accidentally got the highest I'd ever been up until that point and the demons I faced that night made me who I am to Day. The story begins with a high schooler CBD bro who had planned a great adventure with the main homie Salamander and Ricky. Well, not a great adventure per se, we were gonna go to Salamander's place on Friday night and get absolutely obliterated off that Zaza. And for that, I had secured a whole gram of that exotic the Friday before. And although very tough, I fought the urge to blaze for a whole week just so we could demolish it all together in one night. And if you watch some of my older videos, you know Salamander had a bit of a funky home situation, so a lot of times his house was completely free, and this was supposed to be the case on this beautiful night as well. So you know your boy was excited as an 8 year old on Christmas for this upcoming Friday night high extravaganza. But it all came crashing down when Salamander texted me, Hey yo, my parents came home tonight and well, they found my bong, so I'm basically in the gulag now, so no smoke sesh tonight, nor probably the next night, nor or, well, until they leave again. See you once I serve my time. 
L O L. A true tragedy. Our plans have been foiled by none other than Salamander's stinky old bong. I think you guys can see where this story is going. I had a whole gram of that fine exotic grass, and I've been holding myself back for a whole week in anticipation for the now cancelled high extravaganza. So here I was, standing in my shitty little dorm, filled with sorrow. I decided, uh, screw it. I'm gonna just smoke alone. So I put my level 99 J rolling skills to use, and after about 15 minutes of fumbling the spliff, I had done it. I rolled a J that was intended for free people, and headed outside to smoke it all by myself. After heading out, I went to my favorite park bench that was just outside the dormitory territory and started chipping away at the abomination I created. One puff, two puffs, three puffs, <coughs> I was faded than a hoe but nowhere near the fadedness I had been awaiting for. I continued puffing away until I reached the halfway point and my mouth became drier than the Sahara Desert bro. So I took a little break to try to figure out how high I truly was. As I stared into nothingness for a good minute, I felt my first person camera slowly pull away into third person like I was in GTA 5 or something. And I have no shame in saying, I didn't smoke the whole thing, cause I was starting to get a bit paranoid, so I took my half smoked 1G spliff and headed back to my dorm. And bro, you know those creepy pictures that are creepy because they look familiar, like it's just a normal pic, but then you really look at them and realize they ain't normal? Yeah, well, that's how I felt when I walked through the hallway leading to my room. But anyway, once I got to my room, I was still feeling paranoid. Like, it was weird, cause I had never felt that way before from Za, and I think that's just cause when you get high with others, you're kinda comforted by the fact that you're not alone in the feeling of being absolutely smacked out of your mind. Thankfully, I did find some comfort in my favorite platform. YouTube. So I started watching some good vibey videos and slowly snapped out of my paranoid state, but was instantly greeted with a new problem. An uncontrollable sensation that if not satisfied will drive you right back to where you started. I'm talking of course about the munchies. So I gathered my strength and started walking to the closest store, and once I arrived, well, I ain't even gonna lie, my wallet was at the mercy of the za bro, so basically every food item I saw, my brain went, bro, see those Twinkies? That shit looks bussin'. Yeah, I know, but it's $4 and I already got like $25 worth of stuff in my car. Nah, 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 bruh. Screw all that. You buy this fucking bag of Twinkies or I'm giving you a panic attack right here, right now, bro. <laughs> okay, I'll buy the Twinkies. Yeah, of course you will. Well, while you're at it, take that cheese sauce for the nachos too. <laughs> Okay, I will. After my brain finished ganking the shit out of my wallet, I went back to my room and started demolishing everything I bought. And after that whole munch sesh, I was feeling a lot less high too, but also my stomach was a bit upset, so I took a massive dump, laid down on my bed, and started scrolling shorts. And I scrolled and scrolled until I passed out without even brushing my teeth and stealing my clothes. So you can imagine the next day, I had a bit of a cush hangover, feeling like Shrek haziness and overall being slower mentally, but hey, no regrets cause my brain wasn't lying about those Twinkies, god damn. Ever wonder why some dudes can inhale that freshly cut grass an unholy amount of times with eyes so red you think dude is bleeding internally on some exorcist shit, but when asked, how you feeling bro, they'll respond with something like, eh, or honestly, could go for one more J. Well, the reason for a response like that is due to their Right, smoker power. Which, contrary to popular belief, isn't all about tolerance. Although that can be an important factor, it isn't everything. So Randy who's 30 years old and has been on a tea break for 2 years now but has been consistently inhaling that grass for the entirety of his adult life will be much less likely to freak out over some stupid shit than, for example, Jimmy here who's been getting high for 2 months straight every day and claims himself a Za God. The reason for that is, Jimmy, although his tolerance is almost maxed out, still can't handle the fade in a situation even remotely out of his comfort zone. All that being said, we all start off on level 1. Bro, I think it was laced. Ah, level 1, the good old times where the Za was still mysterious and scary. 
This is the level you're at if you've inhaled that magic spice only a couple times and only so in the safest, securest and good vibey situations possible. And honestly, while at this level, you couldn't even imagine doing anything besides eating Doritos and scrolling YouTube shorts whilst blasted. Cause you just haven't gotten used to the feeling the green bestows upon you. That being the increase in significance of every thought and action. And because you don't know how to control it, your experiences with weed are mostly in your own head. So when you high, you can't focus on sh like really the only thing that seems to catch your attention for more than 10 seconds is that sweet sweet flavor on those sour patch kids that you never knew could explode in your mouth like that now depending on if you get in blasted solo or with friends will determine your speed of leveling because usually if you with friends you get used to the zone more quickly because you're socializing plus you know there's always that one guy in the group that likes to mess with the newbies by getting them as high as possible and then being like <laughs> Hey guys, let's go to the gas station. Which might seem whatever, but if it's your first time, you might just have a damn panic attack at that 7-Eleven. Cause I swear, everybody is looking at you, and the cashier, he's onto you. <laughs> yeah, f*** that guy. Anyway, if you keep on eating grass, you'll move on to level 2. I am the Zaza God. Remember Jimmy, the self-proclaimed Zaza God? Yeah, well, he ain't quite the Za God he believes himself to be. To be honest, he barely a Zaw foot soldier. Cause it's all good and fine if he gets blasted up to Mars in the comfort of his own home, but take that comfort away and you'll most likely find him walking behind the group on his own looking like a lost puppy. And the reason for that is, my man's thought that he's been high so many times he can be high anywhere, which sadly isn't the case. Think of tolerance as the size of your dick. It can be massive, destructive in nature, and uncontrollably powerful. But what does that matter if all you use it for is to jerk off? Same with tolerance, it's situational, so you can be unfazed by the za in the comfort of your own home, but as soon as that comfort is taken away, you a total noob again. Instead of focusing on the size of his T, Jimmy should have been focusing on upping his riz and going out and pulling some quality baddies, if you get what I mean. I'd say going from this level to the next is one of the biggest steps in between levels, cause to confidently say you a za god, you should be able to keep your cool in most public situations, even if everybody is staring at you and every car with a hint of blue is a FBI agent ready to take you away for good, you gotta be chill, like a cucumber. And if you do study the cucumber enough while spugging off the broccoli, you might just advance to level 3, Transformer Optimus Prime. This level is called Transformer because it's the level where your Zaza adventures completely transform. Instead of only smoking up at the comfort of you or your friend's home, you can now make plans in somewhat chill public areas like fast food places, cinemas, the park, the spa, or really anywhere where you know people will most likely be minding their own business. And because of this newfound power, you probably have also started blazing that green more, which depending on the type of person you are, it could start affecting your everyday tasks and goals negatively because although hard to admit, the Zaza can and will make you a lazy mofo if you let it. But as I said, it all depends on the shape of your character, so if you can control the inherent laziness the Za tries to curse you with and still keep on rolling with your goals without becoming a Dorito munching World of Warcraft playing stay at home hobgoblin, at some point you'll move on to level 4. Yeah, to be honest. <laughs> I'm high right now. Welcome to the ultimate purgatory and struggle of a consistent Saw enjoyer. As I said before, you only advance to this level if you didn't become a Star Wars lore arguing Prime Dumbledore admiring League of Legends playing high stay at home goblin. Wait, why are you Star Wars lore all the time? And I love Dumbledore. Ah, well, at least I don't play League of Legends. Anyway, as I was saying, it's quite hard to make it to this level, and even harder to stay here, because nowadays, you are so used to doing stuff while splasted, you could theoretically be in that state 24-7. But the problem is, you also know being high 24-7 is expensive, plus, even if you don't notice, I'd say for 95% of people, it makes them less productive as well. So that's why I call it purgatory, because you're constantly pondering the question, should I maybe do a quick hit before doing this? And although I'd love to say I have the answer to that question, I don't. It all depends on you and your situation. So for example, if I had a job interview, I wouldn't do a quick hit. But then again, I know dudes who say the za makes them less nervous and stressed, plus more talkative. So for those people, I'd have to say, go ahead I guess. But if one day you find a definitive answer to the question, 
Should I maybe do a quick grip before this? You'll move on to the final and most elusive level there is. Level 5. Za God. You have entered into your own subconscious and from it dug out answers to humanity's biggest questions like Are we alone? Why are we here? Why is an 80 year old man running for president again? And of course, should I bang that Benjamin a little bit before heading out? Hmm. And I am sorry to inform you guys that I do not know much of this level because I have yet to make it this far myself and I still have no idea why Joe Biden is running for president again. But I can tell you this much. This is the level that completely transcends tolerance as you really don't even need to worry about that anymore cause you know your body to the point you always know what amount is the right amount. Also you have figured out the perfect formula for working hard and following your dreams whilst also inhaling that za and being a chill and interesting dude. Reasons to get high. Now before you call me a weed propagandist this video isn't gonna be on some Number 15 You woke up in the morning or afternoon, or evening. Fuck it, you're awake, time to get up later, right? Instead, we are gonna be looking at actual solid reasons and situations you'll find yourself in, in which getting high will allow you to get and enjoy the full relaxed and faded effect of the za. Cause believe it or not, depending on your mindset, where you are and when you do it, it has a massive effect on if the high will have you laughing and chuckling or tweaking and suffering. Anyway, let's get it started with the most common good reason to get faded and that is, you've had a great productive day and are ready to relax and unwind. I know this one might seem obvious to some, but believe me, it's not for a lot of people cause as we know, the biggest debuff a lot of daily smokers experience is something called za anxiety anxiety, which is like normal anxiety, but it just finished its training arc with King Kai and went Kaioken times 10 on your ass. And if you watch some of my other videos, you'd know that weed is just an amplifier of your already existing thoughts and feelings. So if you smoke up at a time where you got a bunch of unfinished business, the za has a very high chance of making you anxious, kind of like when legit loses his vape. Yo, bro, this shit's an emergency. You see my vape? I know that bitch is here somewhere. Nah, sorry, bro. I haven't seen it. You straight. You straight. Just give me a couple hits off yours were good. I would, but I don't have one anymore. I, I quit a couple weeks back. My f***ing ass you did, bro. I don't care if that shit burnt. Just let me take a hit off that b Nah, bro, I swear. I've been off it for a while now. It, it was tough, but... Man, where's my vape at, bro? F hey, what, what, what you doing, bro? I know your ass has a vape. You're trying to hide that from me. Empty your pockets, buddy. Basically, old unfinished business you have has a very high chance of turning into anxiety once you smoke that doozy. And the whole point of getting lit is to chill out and relax, not stress over your shit that you should have finished before lighting up, brah. Keep in mind though, this usually only happens to people who actually have goals in life and something to be anxious about. So if you've never got an anxiety like this and smoke regularly, then either you only ever blaze up at the perfect time or uh, might wanna, you know, make Maybe sell the PS5 and put down the Doritos for a while? Anyway, next reason is, your MIA, aka sick or injured for a while. Man, do I hate being hobbled to the point I turn into a couch potato and have to endure the torture watching my friends go on adventures from afar like I was Professor X watching my X-Men have all the fun. But there is a secret upside to this as well, cause you see, usually you can't smoke up all day while doing the bare minimum and expect to actually enjoy your high because of the aforementioned za anxiety that accompanies it. But when you've been forcefully demoted to local crippled man and the world along with your doctor is telling you to take a chill for a while, an opportunity comparable only to a childhood sick day emerges. Watch YouTube, play video games, and overall be a useless sack of potatoes all while not feeling bad about it and staying heavily heavily medicated. Cause I don't know about you, but in a situation where there is nothing to keep me sane except video games, movies, and my phone, why would I not be blasted 24-7? And the best part about it is, if you're dealing with a nasty injury like I have for the past two weeks, the Zaza can be used as a substitute for the damn opioid drugs these motherfucking doctors be prescribing you for the pain. I broke my pelvis and one of my vertebrae and I was prescribed codeine. Yeah, the thing SoundCloud rappers be sipping, 
along with some other hardcore meds. So since I know popping pills all day for two weeks can't be much worse than smoking weed, I just chose the one that also makes being crippled a bit more enjoyable. But you know, obviously I'm not a doctor, so don't be just listening to what I say. Every injury is different and what worked for me might not for you. Anyway, next reason. You're hanging out with friends and don't want to drink and be hungover the next day. Would you believe me if I told you smoking weed is actually enjoyable at parties? I think some of you would, but the majority probably wouldn't. And there's a couple reasons for that. A big one that you gotta fix yourself would be that you get anxious when you're high around new people. But the other one I've heard countless times is that being high just makes me want to sit on the couch the whole time. And that can be true, but all you gotta do for that is fight the urge to be lazy. Because I'm telling you from personal experience, one of the funnest high activities by far is blazing up with a friend at a party where everybody else is hammered. I just can't help but notice that everybody drunk turns into NPCs. I be sitting on the couch with the homie Salamander watching all these dudes doing their free assigned activities on some pal world shit. I know this might make me look look like a dick, but this one time we got high at this house party and chose this one alpha chat guy to just observe, and I kid you not, dude was like a Terraria villager, rotating between slamming shots with his friends, trying to spit game to the hoes, and comparing dick sizes with other dudes. Ugh, that was some strong stuff. Damn. Yo guys, <laughs> check out the Rizzler. Hey, what's up, beautiful? <laughs> Having fun? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to find my friend, uh, bye. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Hey, Tony! Let's arm wrestle! Now, don't get me wrong, it's not like doing those three things is unfun. All I'm trying to say is that when you're high, you realize the ridiculousness of what a party actually is and can just observe it with your high friend and banter away. But there is a reason that trumps all others, a situation where it's near impossible to not get the full enjoyment of the gas, the best bang for buck you're gonna get when you trade a small percentage of your lung capacity and cardiovascular health for the fade. And that's of course, you have the CBD bro bomb. Okay, <laughs> it's actually, you plan to smoke such a head for a completely free day. I think some of you might have expected something a bit more extravagant, uh, a bit more, I don't know, eye-opening. But no, unfortunately, there is no magic. Number one, your homie discovered a crashed alien ship from which gained the knowledge of the universe and some otherworldly gas. Time to get absolutely shrecked. Cause I hate to break it to you, but if your homie ever tells you something like that, that universal knowledge is probably just the mushrooms he ate, and that other worldly gas is referring to the moon rock he bought at the dispensary. And going and smoking with that friend, however much you like him, probably isn't a good reason, especially cause it's a Tuesday morning, and you know, you should probably go to work, and maybe set up an intervention for him. Man's doesn't seem to be in a good place. Anyway, overusing psychedelics and ruining your life aside, the best reason to get high in my opinion is when you plan it ahead and have a mega sesh with your homies. This one is basically the same as the first reason, but even better because it combines both banter with your friends and the lowest chance of Xi anxiety because the fade is planned ahead, therefore your brain already scheduled a server maintenance for that time, allowing you to drop IQ points without worrying about a situation arising where you need them. And it really is hard to be lighting one up with the people you enjoy talking and listening to, cause although technically getting Getting high will never be the best move you can make to achieve your goals and shit. If you smoke up for reasons such as listed in this video, I promise you, aside from the health implications it might have, the za won't affect your life negatively, but rather give you a break from your daily grind and make you slow down a bit to appreciate everything you have. Types of plugs you will encounter. This topic is very near and dear to my heart, cause unfortunately to this day, I still have to rely on these guys for my zaza. So you can imagine after years of experience of buying from tens of different plugs, I'm quite certain I have dealt with every kind there is, from the most vicious acting as gangsta as humanly possible thugs, to the high school dudes who just want to fund their Zaza addiction by selling it. And I think it's appropriate to start off with the type of plug I bought from my very first time. 
And he was the friend who knows a guy who knows a guy who has that exotic. This one isn't really officially a plug per se, but then again, I'm willing to bet this was how most people first encountered any type of Zaza seller. Every time when you and your friends discussed the grass and wanted to try it, he always said something like, Yeah man, if you really want some, I got a few connects and they always sell that exotic. But in reality, dude's connects were usually his older brother or friend who actually knew someone. So for me, the times I did acquire the grass through this man, that shit was always some Reggie for real. And not just that, it always had a massive markup, cause who else can you sell oregano mix mid za for premium price than a bunch of stupid youngsters? But I can't fault the homie too much, cause back then, man I swear, you could smell some grass and get faded, so everything seemed exotic, even if it was mostly herbs and spices bought at the discount aisle at Walmart. But even so, I ain't mad, cause that's the nature of business I guess. If a dude is willing to buy your oregano pack for $30, then so be it. You gotta learn from it and move on. And so I did, and found myself a new plug, who was the... Yeah, bro, th that's an eighth. It's just like super compact. You know, like a diamond. The dude who always shorts you. A plug like this never has any longevity. Cause I mean, after being shorted one or two times max, however much you crave the za, usually your self-respect won't allow you to go back to man's like... So? Got the eighth? Yeah, yeah, of course, dog. I'ma hook you up nicely this time. This some good shit. Nice. Show me the bag real quick, though. Gotcha, big dog. Here it is. Uh, uh, w w where is it? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold up, my bad. Y you need this to see it. Uh, okay. Do you see it now? It's like super compact. You know, like a diamond. Yeah, yeah, like, like a diamond, right? Yeah, okay, but um, uh, I'm gonna have to skip this one. I don't really even want any za right now. All right, bro, you're a loss. Get the fuck out of my car. You don't want no smoke, don't want no jazz. These are the plugs who exclusively sell to stupid kids, because anybody with any understanding of how one gram of za should look like would just tell them to F off and remove him on Snapchat. But this guy also abuses his status of the plug to provoke fear into dudes who don't yet know any better and think these guys are all freaking mafia level gangsters who if you disagree with them finna pull a Scarface and take out a M249 and start going bananas. But don't feel too bad if you've fallen for this scam before, because I have too. In fact, I I had a friend who was supposed to get one gram, but the plug gave him 0.1, and my man still bought it. Mostly because he didn't even know how much a gram is supposed to look like, so he just trusted him. And unfortunately, 0.1 grams of grass won't really get you faded. Type on the list is the complete opposite, and one of my favorites, and he is the always faded plug. This guy could also be called the plug who only sells to fund his copious amount of Zaza consuming on a daily basis, and why he is one of my favorites is for more multiple reasons. Firstly, because he is the king of getting high off his own supply, he always has a comment on the stuff you're getting. Secondly, because man's is faded 24-7, he don't really want any confrontation, so he'll probably never short you. In fact, sometimes out of the warmth of his heart, he'll throw some extra in there, depending if he likes you as a customer or not. And lastly, because he has evolved to a point where being high is his normal state, which don't ever get that far, it's not good for your health, and it can and will ruin your life no matter how much you hear. Zaza isn't addictive, it can be if you take it too far. But anyway, because of the fact he cannot live without the magic ring plan in his system, in my experience, he has always had a 100% success rate to the text, Hey yo, you got any? That meaning, Mans is more reliable than a Volvo. Mans is more dependable than James Bond. Mans is more loyal than a golden retriever, god damn! The only problem, well, problem for you, the customer, is he is usually pretty on and off on the plug-in business. Because if you can get that addicted to Za, it's usually a personality trait. So knowing that, this guy either smokes every day 24-7, or he is completely grass-free. And when he is grass-free, he disappears like the Avatar. So yeah. But now on to the next plug on the list, and he is... The plug who should've probably started an actual business instead. This plug is quite rare, and I've only ever met one of these mofos, but... Oh boy, what a roller coaster ride it was. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was looking for some grass, so I hit up my usual plug, only for him to inform me he is, quote, out of the game. But will give me the Snapchat of a guy who is, quote, 
new to the game. And so he did. And after writing man's asking for some grass, he told me to meet up near a construction store. And since this was a while ago, I ain't have my license yet, so I ran me an e-scooter and rolled up. And the person who greeted me was none other than Mr. Invisible. Yeah, no, that was like his actual Snapchat username. Anyway, it was the short guy who kinda looked like a goblin, but he seemed quite serious and was the first plug ever to write me afterwards asking, how was the stuff? And after replying, he also gave me a freaking affiliate program. Not for real. He told me every friend I link him up with, he will give me 20 bucks if they ever buy from him. I ended up not doing that cause it kinda seemed ridiculous. Like bro, you sell grass, not fucking VPN subscriptions. But over the next 6 months, I would see this man build a Snapchat grass cartel. Dudes was posting stories every day of his illegal activities like he had the cops under his payroll or something. And funniest part was, over the 6 months that I acquired the grass from him, I saw how his $10 camo pants and $15 Shane jacket turned into Gucci pants and an Armani jacket like god damn bro was really trying to be the local Scarface and dudes even had mofos working for him like sometimes I'd write him and he'd literally reply come here I'll get an employee to bring it to you employee employee bro was acting like he Mr. Crab sending Spongebob to secure the secret formula but unfortunately his plugging career ended in about six months where he sent us off with a heartwarming goodbye on his snapchat story reading Greetings, my beloved customers. I am informing you all that I will unfortunately no longer be your plug, as I am moving on. It was great while it lasted, and I wish you all the best. As for the Zaza, I mentioned three people in this story who will fill my shoes in this field. Stay cool. Peace out. And the craziest part is, I'm not making any of this up. This dude was a legit comedy movie character, and his personality reflected it. He was like the generic Slav Trapper guy who tried his hardest to act as gangsta as humanly possible, and every sense man said had to have at least two curse words. So yeah, although he is the most memorable pug I've ever had, he definitely wasn't my favorite. That spot has to go to the friendly neighborhood plug. The best plug a man can ask for. This will be the dude that lives close to your neighborhood so you don't have to travel around the whole of Skyrim just to get some za. But if that wasn't enough, this is the plug that also, as the name suggests, is friendly and doesn't act all gangsta nor shorts you for no reason nor is high 24-7, he's just a chill, reliable guy. And sometimes, he'll even come to you, cause you live in the same neighborhood and he enjoys riding his bike while flipping packs and making racks. And unfortunately, however much this dude is just a normal human being, in the field of plugs, well, he's like a diamond. Very rare. So if you you got yourself a plug like this be thankful for your blessings because your next one is probably gonna be the usual local wannabe Pablo Escobar but hey plugs usually switch like every four months anyway so don't be discouraged when yours is well weird the five levels of being high. Now, I bet you've seen a couple videos on this topic, maybe even mine, but since almost a year has passed and my knowledge and understanding of the Magic Green plan has grown tremendously, I thought it's about time to make the ultimate, definitive, most precise levels of high tier list on planet Earth. And to make it even more fun, for every level, I'ma be getting more high to give an accurate representation of what the level feels and sounds like. So let's get it started with level one, Microdosed. This is the level where you you don't really feel anything per se, but you can tell something is different. You have a slight mood boost and your body might feel a bit more elevated. So like if your legs were sore, they'd probably be more sore now. But if you're lying on your bed, well, it's comfortability is probably up about by 10 to 15 percent. Nothing crazy, but it is noticeable. This, however, isn't enough to give you the giggles. So that Amy Schumer comedy special will still leave you wondering if my vagina is actually comedy or just poorly done slapstick humor. And since I'm currently at this level, I can tell you it also has no negative side effects, so I can still do everything without worrying if I'm too high. Anyway, let's move on to the first exciting level, and that is level 2. I'm feeling it. So you're feeling it, eh? Well, me too. This is the level where that Amy Schumer special might actually forcefully steal a giggle or two from you, but not because it's actually funny, it's more like you're laughing at her rather than with her. Anyway, since you're now feeling it, you also might be feeling that movie a bit more, or that video game. <laughs> You might be feeling your own jokes a bit more. Got you laughing at your own thoughts, fool. This is also the optimal high if you still got stuff to do. <laughs> well, to be honest, if you got stuff to do, probably better do not be high. But 
at this level, it's still definitely doable, just a bit more difficult. Another way to look at it is, this is the high the workers at Subway are usually on, although I have seen mofos way beyond this there too, but for the most part, this is optimal cause the loud hasn't got you moving slow-mo quite yet. As for me, I'm still able to read this script and pronounce my words just fine, so you probably can't even tell I'm high right now. But now, it's time to get to the first level where a mofo can feel too high if he's not experienced. Level 3. Yeah, I'm pretty high. So here we are, pretty high. This is the point where, at least for me, doing anything besides leisurely activities is hard. Not impossible, nor undoable, but hard. If we take that Amy Schumer comedy special for reference again as for some reason I like doing, it might just maybe have become funny, but you also realize you just high, so you turn it off and watch something else. Also, this is the first level where some thoughts might have become uncontrollable in the senses you just can't help but dive deeper into the fact that the bomb dropped on Hiroshima was almost 1600 times less powerful than the Tsar bomb created and detonated by the Soviets in 1961 as a show of power to the US. But then you find out there's something called an antimatter bomb which could be even more destructive. But it's only a theory, but then maybe the US is developing it in an area 51 or something. Yeah, I think you get the point. But there is one sensation that is more powerful than your random thoughts, and that of course is the munchies. Coupled with the fact you're probably rocking some dry mouth right now, this in my opinion is the best level to be at if you're trying to stuff your face with enough trans fats to feed 50 hungry children. But you know, you already ate it also. Anyway, moving on to level 4. Faded beyond belief. This is the point where if you're not in a safe space, you kinda screwed. Well, not always, but at this level, it's become almost impossible to practice rational thinking. I mean, if you were diving deeper into that nuclear bomb stuff at the previous level, then this is a point where you might start actually believing you are Oppenheimer himself. This stage is really not the best if you're looking to focus on a movie or video game or really anything because, well, your attention span is at the mercy of the za and to actually enjoy this high, you just gotta go with the flow. As for me, it's getting pretty hard to read the script. If I look at the words for long enough, they kinda look like some ancient Chinese hieroglyphs. But anyway, if you're an actual lunatic, maniac, psychopath, Zaza destroyer, and considering hitting that gravity one more time, then be prepared for level 5. Shadow Realm. I told you bro, you gotta be a maniac to get to this level because the plane of existence you on now is so different from being non-high, you probably feeling and looking like a goddamn alien. I mean bro, your eyes are so red and you feel so disconnected from your body that if you look in the mirror, you'll probably think, bro, is that really me? I'm so fucked up. Wait. Ah, uh, shit, I'm in the Shadow Realm again, aren't I? And now that you realize you're in the Shadow Realm, you either stop the trip by going to sleep, or... Level Unknown. Exploring the Shadow Realm. This level doesn't require smoking more. All it really requires you to do is just go outside and explore the world that in many ways has become the upside down from Stranger Things. Cause at this level, rational thinking has been completely thrown out the window and your brain has reverted to factory settings as of when you were just born. So if you see a streetlight flickering for example, if you were normal, you just think, they really should fix that. Compared to now, Oh shit bro, this is totally one of those slasher scenes where once I walk over the street light, he's gonna shift me up, isn't he? Nah man, fuck this, I'm outta here. <laughs> At least, I don't know, that's how it feels to me when I achieve the pinnacle of high and am wandering the world outside. Man, smoking too much is such an awkward thing, especially because of how normalized getting faded has become. Nobody wants to be the guy who kills the vibe by admitting they grain in the fuck out. Like dudes be knowing they approach and they limit, but peer pressure is a bitch. Like this one time in school when we were smacking the paper planjamin on lunch break, and I could tell everybody was nearing the border between Yodi land and the upside down. But this motherfucker sound like, 
Xander just kept on passing to Jay, and nobody wanted to be the first one to back out. Everyone kept on puffing and puffing until this one motherfucker just started puking like god damn. Safe to say, dude probably hasn't smoked again till this day. But you know, that was high school. Most kids went on that Wiz Khalifa pack like Salamander. I mean, this dude's parents were barely home, so Mans must have just been low-key looking for attention by acting out. But instead, all he got was Snoop Dogg's tolerance and all the school thought he's daily driving his dick. Some of you might not even know what it feels like when you smoke too much though. She, I know I didn't. My dumbass always just concluded that the stuff was laced, which looking back at it now makes me feel like a dingle bop for real. I mean, how you gonna smoke way more than you usually do in a situation you're not super comfortable in and then blame it on the weed? It's like a drunk driver suing an alcohol brand for making him unable to drive straight. Shit, it's like going to the store and buying too much food and then blaming the cashier for not stopping you. Like, bro, it's not on Jimmy to plug God. Dude is probably smoking the same stuff as we speak. And yeah, I know sometimes it could actually be laced, but what does telling yourself that help? Like, wouldn't it be better to believe it's not and your brain is just tweaking? Then you could maybe, you know, calm yourself down. Unlike when you've convinced yourself the plug is a fucking super villain going around giving his customers schizophrenia. Like, goddamn, son, someone's gotta like the bat signal for real. But shit, I'm out here preaching like I ain't done this myself. Back when I was younger, I did green out a couple times, but since then, I have developed rules I follow to avoid this at all costs. Like, for example, first rule. You don't always gotta get obliviated, bruh. Seems simple enough, right? But back in the day, every time we were smoking, my dumbass felt like I had to get higher than last time. Once the J reached me, I just... <laughs> Thanks, bro. You guys got another one? <laughs> bro. No. There's just some basic etiquette too, like everybody won't get faded equally, but one thing with smokers is they usually always chill and peaceful, so when you start hogging a spliff, rarely is somebody gonna forcefully take that shit from you. Just next time when you pull up, they'll bag your ass, pistol whip you, throw you in the trunk, and bury you alive next to Mr. Beast. That video would probably have to be on Rumble though. But uh, point is, you don't always gotta be the highest in the room. Second rule, accept your limits. This is low key the most important, and the most difficult, but you might be thinking something like, don't you mean know your limits? No I don't bro. Cause I bet most y'all know them just when you'll be watching Fulcrum Yo, smacking yeah. the Benjamin like that bitch be only containing O2, you get a false understanding on how much mofos be actually smoking. Cause you can always do more, but what you can't do is forcefully remove the THC from your system and get less high. So don't be a victim of peer pressure just cause you wanna be cool, no. fool. But these rules don't mean shit if you don't factor in where you are and what you're doing. Which leads me to the day that made me come up with these rules. The time in my young life when I smoked so much in the wrong place, I was goddamn oblivious. Obliviated. She I smoked so much I had less dialogue options than an oblivion NPC. The first time I got high outside the comfort of me or a friend's crib. It was the usual business. We were chilling with the gremlins, me, Salamander, and Ricky. Smoking up, talking about how we don't fall with school and how we finna make it out the hood. You know, the usual Gen Z shit. When Salamander being the thotty magnet he was, got a text from one of his female companions inviting to what this motherfucker claimed to be a chill hangout spot. Although I do trust the homies, knowing Salamander's track record, I was a bit sus, cause I seen the places this dude hangs out at. I be waking up at the middle of the night to take a piss, then check the snap only to see dudes partying at some straight up trap house fucking off fucking ketamine. Okay, can't say that on YouTube, but let's just say it wasn't weed. Anyway, you know the drill. I don't wanna go, Salamander uses his 99 speech, convinces Ricky, now it's a 2v1, and I fold. Epic victory royale. But I agreed only under the condition that and none of us drink nor do anything else but smoke the lords loud because it was a motherfucking Thursday after all so I wasn't trying to pull up the school smelling like a bum acting like a depressed middle-aged man from the hangover. Looking back at it though that was probably the wrong call cause well, well you'll see. So we're walking to the crib and Salamander lights up this comically big J that he rolled back at his place with a week supply. While we're almost finished puffing and on the edge of obliviation I see this super dope house that seems to be having a party so I I excitedly asked Salamander, Yo, is that the spot? Bro, okay, that place does seem pretty dope. Oh yeah, that's the spot. Glad you fought with it. Some people are kinda put off by it from the initial appearance. Anyway, let's just go in. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty cool. Uh, you first though. Uh, wh where are you going? Uh, wh what do you mean? <laughs> the crib, bro. Leave it to Salamander to have you walk through an amazing street filled with beautiful houses and lead you to the only one that looks like Shrek's vacation home. <laughs> to add to it, me and Ricky were quite frankly bugging. 
But as I mentioned in the previous rules, that's not always a good thing, especially when you're preparing to go into a house where your brain has calculated a 50-50 chance of being stabbed in the gut by a freaking tweaker with a kitchen knife. In my head, I was thinking, well, hoping for the saying, don't judge a book by its cover to be the case here. But oh boy, I should have judged a goddamn book by its cover and dashed off like Prime Usain Bolt. Cause what we were dealing with was in every sense of the word except not containing any of the actual substance, I think, a crack house. These people were blasting some of the most disgusting music I've ever heard. Shit sounding like the noise a speaker makes when you fiddle with the aux cord. And because I was high, that set the whole tone of my experience there. And shit, I did not know Salamander hanged out with vampires. Most of the dudes there were looking what you would imagine the local bum to be when he was young. I was in total shock. My teenage brain could not comprehend the degeneracy, the idiocy, the overall lack of humanity in that house. And it's not like I didn't try to have fun, but our highness did not mix with whatever the fuck these guys guys were on. At some point, I saw him pull out a vodka bottle and they drank the whole thing in five minutes dry, straight from the bottle, like they were trying to speed run liver failure. I attempted to conversate with some of them, but to no avail. I mean, what did I expect though? A drunk person usually isn't on the same wavelength as a high person, combined with the fact these dudes probably just got done sacrificing a goat to bring forth the Antichrist, I was starting to tweak the fuck out. Well, not tweak, I guess. Me and Ricky did have some fun by just bantering about how messed up of a place we had found ourselves in. All of this didn't seem to affect Salamander though, as we spotted him rising up a girl we assumed was the one that invited him, but we were wrong in that assessment because five minutes later the girl who actually invited him saw it, went up to him, yelled at him, and then slapped that man so hard it made him rethink his whole damn life. Cause as we were laughing at what had happened, he walked straight towards us and said, man. You guys wanna do some ketamine? Nah, he actually told us that this was probably a bad idea and that he's ready to leave if we are. Good thing too, cause if that girl hadn't slapped some sense into him, Salamander might have gone on to do the thing I mentioned like three times in this video. So anyway, we went back home at like 2am or something, put on some WWE on the TV, prepared to gleep and got obliviated, 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 obliviated. Doesn't go much further than that. 10,000 BC, a group of cavemen in the Oki Islands of Japan needed some warmth and wanted to start a fire when they discovered a funny looking green plant and either out of curiosity or desperation took it and inadvertently created history's first ever hotbox. Yet this early grass was not that loud that people be smoking today because as we know over the years the za has been scientifically and artificially cultivated to be much more concentrated in the high it gives. So, although it is funny to think about a group of cavemen purposely starting a fire in a small shelter for the sole purpose of getting faded in a hoe, it is unlikely that it actually ever happened. Yet aside from this iffy recreational stint in Japan, hemp was first commonly used in the lands that are modern day Mongolia and China for more practical uses like eating it. Which after saying that you might be imagining something like this. Yo what's up, how you doing? Had any fun with those new seeds I gave you? Yo, uh, nah, I actually came here to give them back. Last night I was looking at the moon and <laughs> I swear that motherfucker was looking right back at me. But alas, this probably wasn't the reality because the THC levels in this early cultivated Zaza were just really low, but soon the Chinese would discover that the holy plant's fibers were also great for making stuff too, like clothes, paper, and bowstrings. Which turns out hemp fibers were superior to the bamboo ones used by rivaling factions, allowing the Chinese to shoot their arrows much further. So basically, back in the day, if you were having a long distance bow battle and were losing, you might have screamed out, We need to get closer! These motherfuckers have weed! Anyway, it wasn't long after when mofos realized that the loud wasn't only good for making stuff, it was also great for treating physical maladies. And after a couple thousand years, Emperor Chen Nung, known as the father of Chinese medicine, included the magic plant in his medical encyclopedia under the name Ma. Which, that sounds oddly similar to Za, doesn't it? I'm guessing every couple thousand years, the first letter changes or something. But now, let's explore the question we're all asking. When exactly did mofo start ripping that shit to get faded. Well, one of the earliest counts is about 2,500 years ago when researchers discovered 10 mini barbecues in a cemetery near modern day Tajikistan that had residue of burnt cannabis with a much higher concentration of THC than normal. Probably meaning it was selectively bred to get you, well, 
lit. Although this was one of the first counts of people purposely inhaling the broccoli to get high, it was most likely used as part of a ritual to invoke an altered state of mind, so you could communicate with spirits. Which shit, dog? I wanna know what these dudes were smoking, cause I ain't never heard of no grass that gets you to the spirit realm. This might have low-key been the last Kush Snoop Dogg smoke, cause once you get so high you start communicating with your dead grand grand, that's when you really might be like, okay. I think it's about time I stop smoking this shit. Since cannabis for one reason or another proved to be quite the useful plant, people started trading it around the world as soon as it was domesticated. Which the only people who didn't really fall with the Zaza were Europeans who preferred getting hammered instead. Which is low key reflected in modern times too, especially in the northern countries where once you turn 18 you can drink as much poison as you want but if you want to blaze, well you might be looking at a little bit of jail time my boy. But now let's quickly go over the uses of cannabis cannabis throughout different cultures so we can move on to the modern age, starting with Hindus. They made something called Bang, an edible cannabis paste that had medicinal properties but also got you high. This could be added to a variety of foods and drinks which this Bang was the preferred food of the Hindu god Shiva, making him in my eyes the god of edibles. Disclaimer, that was a joke. Islam, here the za was called hashish and was introduced about 1000 years ago, which hashish wasn't strictly forbidden in the Quran at first so a lot of Muslims ate it for its medicinal and relaxation properties. But later Egypt basically banned it and also the Quran was revisited by many and reinterpreted to include hashish to be banned just like alcohol. The Vikings. These dudes basically used the Zod to make rope, sailcloth and other things but also for its medicinal properties, mostly to relieve pain and to date there's no hard evidence that they consumed it for its recreational use but you know. Maybe they should have cause they were quite the horrendous savages and murderers so it might have made them think a little bit about peace and love. But what about America, England, and the actual global world powers, how did they react to weed? Well, again, like the Chinese, Europeans and Americans at first prominently used the magic green plant in the 16th to 18th century for more practical things like making sailcloth and rope. Which the plant itself grew much larger in the New World soil, and combined with the practicality of it, everything started being hemp derived. Clothes, paper, well, basically anything that required fibers. But the question still remains, when did mofo start smoking that shit to get blasted on the regular? Cause although at some point you, your neighbor, your grandma, your boss, and even George <laughs> Washington were out here growing weed, wasn't nobody out here rolling them up. Well, until the arrival of Mexicans. The loud version of first arrived in Brazil in the early 1500s by way of enslaved Africans traveling with the Portuguese. And the native South Americans who are already consuming some other psychoactive substances quickly started blazing the Zaza too and its use soon spread across South America and into Mexico. From which in the 1910s is when the loud first spread into the US via Mexican immigrants escaping the effects of the Mexican revolution. And almost immediately the good good was viewed as a threat and by 1931, 29 states had banned its use. Although it wasn't really the Zaza that the US didn't fall with, it was unfortunately mostly just racism against Mexican Americans and black citizens of the south, which both these groups were enjoyers of the Zaza to some regard, so it became a scapegoat for racial bias in the US, and they blamed it for everything from petty crimes all the way to murder. And in 1937 the US completely banned all non-medical use of weed, which all this kind of explains why the mostly peaceful plant has been thrown in the same schedule schedule 1 category with full on life destroying substances like heroin and cocaine. But thankfully a couple decades later came the hippie movement of the 1960s to 1970s. This is what likely sparked a comeback for weed cause unlike before when the Zaza was mostly smoked by Mexican immigrants and black citizens who the US was massively racist against, the hippie movement had middle class white American youth start blazing too. Which it was all about love, peace, spirituality, non-violence and of course every hippie's favorite, recreational drug use. Although most hippies Hippies were all about peace and love, that was quite easy to say when most of them were literally privileged enough to drop out of college, run off with Cassandra in a rainbow van, go on copious amounts of mindset altering trips mostly powered by LSD, and then return 10 years later to their parents and have them say, it's okay son, I was young and stupid once too. Anyway, although the grass
class was still federally illegal, this didn't really do much cause in 1976, 1 in 8 Americans over the age of 12 admitted to smoking it in the past 30 days. Hippies though were especially interested in cannabis, so much so they went on something called the Hippie Trail, which was basically an excursion by the youth of the world to go over to the Middle East and India all while riding in magic buses and discovering new ways to get absolutely blasted. Such as smoking the concentrated Zaza resin known as hash. But acquiring the Zaza would soon get much harder, because you see, most of it came from Mexico, so in 1969 the US started patrolling the border, and in 1975 they got even more aggressive and started spraying herbicide on Mexican wheat plants. And so good old supply and demand made grass prices skyrocket, which a lot of people started then growing the plant themselves, and many greenhouses, closets, bathtubs, storage units, basements, wherever they could. But then in 1982, Mr. Smarty Pants Ronald Reagan took it even a step further by encouraging the streamlined arrest of anyone in possession of an illegal substance, which was really dumb because most of the focus was on pot, all while crack, meth and heroin were all still being transported and consumed on a regular basis. Even worse, this enforcement seemed to be racially motivated because despite plenty of traffickers and consumers being white, the majority of arrests were Latino and black youths, all while this bizarre overfocus on cannabis allowed the growing opioid epidemic to go unchecked. But thankfully the US is slowly learning from their mistakes, where today 24 states have legalized the recreational use of marijuana. On top of that, the increased level of research on it has also found multiple medical use cases and can be prescribed to you by special doctors if seen fit. And although the Zaza is still federally illegal and a schedule 1 drug, the overall perception of it has changed for the better. Including in December 2022 when President Biden signed a bill to make it easier for research to obtain plants for their studies, which will hopefully accelerate the learning of positive and negative side effects of consuming the za even further. But all that aside, the overall vibe towards the loud has gotten a lot more accepting, and these days more and more people view the smoking of the grass not as you being a junkie, but the same way as having a couple beers with the homies on a Friday night and watching some WWE. Running out of za. Man, I swear, this phenomenon is always so unexpected, like, I don't know why, but for some reason, however long I plan ahead and try to time my grass running out, it always comes kicking in oh, like yeah. the damn Kool-Aid, man. I'll be out here the night before, looking at the bottom of my grinder like, oh, okay, I guess I gotta buy some more tomorrow. And then when the next day comes, I'll be all flabbergasted like, oh boy, nothing better than some good old za at the end of the... Day. What? Th th this can't be. H how have I ran out of Za? I, I literally just had some yes. Uh, yeah, shit. And now that you realize that you out of grass, you got two, well, three options. You either accept your fate and just go on with your night, hit up your plug and get ready to lose out on your hard earned money, or the legendary special down bad method I often do, empty out all your grinders, search through all your pockets, and scrape together one last hit so you can delay the buying of the ZA for one more day. But although I do this quite often, I don't recommend it, cause I swear, those scrape together hits are always some 20% plastic, 20% dust, 20% dirt, smack dabbly doos. So every time I do hit that awful abomination of a bowl, it'll have me all paranoid about what the f did I just smoke like? <laughs> uh, man, why, why that smell like burning plastic? Why am I not even high? Bro, why am I so lightheaded? Mom! I think I'm dying. Basically what I'm saying is scraping together hits from basically nothing isn't really the healthiest move you can make. But she hitting up the plug at the end of the day is a struggle in its own right. Cause I don't know why these damn plugs are always unavailable when you need them the most. Like Mr. Invisible could be spamming me all day with snapchats like But then later, when your hitman's up asking for some za, he disappears like the avatar. <laughs> Doesn't even open your messages. These plugs really don't care about us for real, man. Speaking of which, that reminds me of this one time when we ran out and had to travel through the whole of the ghetto version of Narnia just to get some za. It was just a normal day, well, night, where me, Salamander, and Ricky had planned to smoke some grass and just chill. And of course, Salamander being the ultra-reliable photographic memory dude he is, informed us that he def has enough 
enough grass for us all to enjoy at his place. So me and Ricky pull up, excited as you can be, only to arrive at the house and be informed. Yo, what's good? Are you ready to get absolutely schmacked? She, of course, Phil, but, uh, but what? Yeah, I, I just checked my room and, well, it turns out I don't have any grass. What do you mean, you have no grass? You said you had a ton, bro. Yeah, I, I mean, I did, but, uh, I, I kind of smoked it all. Man, what the... Why you gotta do us like that, bro? You got us all hyped for this, and now we're here in your mansion, and you're telling us there's no grass? Like, like bro, I'm, I'm finna cry, for real, man. Yeah, bro, you're right, I'm sorry, I messed up, but, but, but don't worry, I already hit up Jimmy the Plug God. We can drive there now. Uh, okay, okay, sure, sure, let, let, let's go. So we go into Salamander's parents' car, which was sleek AF, and quite literally went to the bad part of town with it, feeling like some mafia bosses, for real. But once we arrived at Jimmy the Plug God's house, he was nowhere to be seen, and well, turns out, dude hadn't even texted Salamander back, he just had us come here in hopes that the time we arrived, he would. As we were sitting in the car, waiting for a good 15 minutes at that point, Salamander tells us the dude's probably isn't gonna respond, but but he already wrote another plug and he def gonna hook us up. So we drive to a new place where this time the plug was actually waiting for us. So we hopped out the car and walked towards him. Yo, what's good, bruh? Uh, yo, what's up? So, do you got that Zaza? Uh, of course, yeah, yeah. H here it is. Bro, is that two G's like I asked? Uh, yeah, yeah, this is just compact, you, you know, like a dime. Bro, fuck off. If that's two G's, then prove it. What are you waiting for? Put it on the scale. Nah, bro, I don't sell to people who don't trust me. Uh, dis disrespectful AF. Nah, bro, disrespectful is trying to show the long term customer in his hour of need. Keep your diamond to yourself, big dog. We out of here. <laughs> yeah, whatever, see. As our hopes were dwindling, we were in Salamander's car about to call it quits, when the only plug that was exclusive to me and nobody else knew of, finally responded to my message saying to meet up and that he got the za. So we go to yet another location in hopes that finally we would get our now well-deserved bag of grass. And once we arrived at the meetup spot, which was a pizza restaurant by the way, we parked the car and text Mr. Invisible that we're outside waiting for him. A good 10 minutes goes by with no response, so the overall mood is starting to get pretty gloomy, as we quite literally have just driven around for hours trying to secure just a smidgen of za. And although we were truly experiencing a Gen Z 21st century Great Depression, we were saved with the text. Oh, he responded. Oh, snap. What, what, what'd he say, bro? Uh, he said, uh, yeah, coming out now. Nice. And this time, he actually did. Dudes came out with an apron, chef's hat, and the long-awaited bag. So he went there, and thankfully, it was actually two Gs, not a diamond. And man, I ain't never been so glad for just a smidgen of Zion in my life, but can you blame me? I mean, this was a full-on journey, and although the time was like 11 p.m. at this point, we weren't too discouraged as we thought, screw it, let's pull an all-nighter, baby. So finally, after hours are waiting and talking to incompetent plugs, we arrived back at the mansion and did what we came there to do. Smoke a shit ton of grass, eat an unholy amount of munch, and wake up the next day feeling more hazy than a foggy morning. Which the highlight of the night was definitely when Salamander said he was gonna bake some magic cookies, but since we were already f***ed AF, dudes left them in the oven for like 3 hours. And then finally when we had that Oh shit, the cookies! Moment. We went there and found him completely burnt. But, you know, we still ate him and, well, they kinda worked, I think? I don't know. We were so blasted, we probably could've eaten some damn Oreos and thought ourselves more high because of it. So, all in all, running out of za is, for some reason, always so unexpected. But I've learned to enjoy the journey as much as the destination. And although, at the time, driving around searching for grass was annoying AF, Looking back at it, it was actually pretty fun. And the night was definitely more memorable because of it. The first high, a core memory. And whether you enjoyed it or not, doesn't really matter. Because for 95% of people, their first time literally shapes their entire opinion on the grass. Almost everybody who isn't age 50 or over and says, Weed is the work of the devil. It should be more illegal than 
and, and even math. Well, actually it is. Desire is schedule one and meth is schedule two, so. Yeah, that's right. That's why I love America. Greatest damn country in the world. USA, USA, USA. Anyway, what I was saying was that most people who tweak their first time are put off by it for a while and shape into za haters. And people who have fun their first time, believe it or not, don't all become mindless junkies who eat little Caesars and watch SpongeBob all day. Rather, when asked their opinion on weed, they'll probably just say, My stomach turned into an endless void with an unquenchable hunger for anything edible, which was followed by a sleepiness so uncontrollable. I passed out halfway into my 25th Twinkie. It was pretty fun. So obviously me, CBD bro, who runs an entire YouTube channel dedicated to the green plant, must have had the latter experience, right? Well, not really. As you see, when I was but a wee lad, uncontaminated by the forbidden fruits of the world like alcohol, nicotine, and yes, weed, always believed that alcohol makes you homeless, nicotine makes you a little bitch, and weed makes you lazy. Thinking that, I didn't want to waste not just my first high, but my very first time feeling anything besides normal on eating Doritos and watching Family Guy. Which, after turning 17, I decided it was about time I lost my substance virginity and planned to do so on Christmas dinner, where I was gonna let El Marihuana put its big, fat, thick, juicy, delicately rolled J in my mouth. But only after I had eaten, as I believed if my tummy was full, I wouldn't get the munchies and could instead contemplate the meaning of life my time high. And thankfully, I had an older brother who was more than willing to give me a puff or two from his Christmas dinner J for $4 to fucking cheapskate. So we went upstairs and started puffing, which Rezex was instantly bamboozled from the magic grass. Nice, it's not a dud. Now it's my turn. I grabbed the J and puffed and puffed until I could puff no more. And the result was... I didn't feel a damn thing. Still had to pay the $4 though. Fucking bullshit. Anyway, as we went through the day, I got increasingly more jealous of my brother, who by his words was fried AF. I was beginning to think, maybe I'm immune to getting high. Which, after telling my brother this theory, he concluded that I'm stupid and just didn't inhale the in my lungs. And so generously told me to follow him upstairs where he gave me a couple more puffs. For an extra four dollars, the damn venture capitalist. As I was smoking away, keeping in mind to inhale it all the way down to my lungs, I still wasn't feeling anything, and my hopes of getting fried AF were beginning to look more like a distant dream. When I finished puffing, I sat down at the computer to look at some of those watch while high videos, and my brother asked me, "So, do you feel anything now?" No, I, I don't, I don't. <laughs> What's this weird ch I, I don't- I'm, I'm- I'm not sure. I don't know, seems to me you're fried like some Kentucky chicken, boy. I was indeed fried, and incredibly so. Although I didn't smoke a ton, my body had never experienced anything besides a sugar rush and maybe a caffeine kick. So as I was watching this Watch While well You're High video, I was laughing at everything and was tripping the f*** out. But not in a bad way, it was freaking amazing. Being high was what I always imagined it to be until... Bloop. I'm sober again. Yeah, you heard right. My first high lasted like 30 seconds, and in an instant, I was back to normal, which I don't know why. Even to this day, when I tell people about this, nobody can relate, because no one has experienced this phenomenon. But since I'm a scientist, I have developed a super duper concrete theory backed by quantum mechanics and the late great Stephen uh. Hawking on my experience, and overall the reason why a lot of people who smoke their first time don't feel anything. I theorize that all humans have a natural block against foreign substances, a wall per se, and when an individual inhales za, the particles act kind of like micro-missiles targeting your cannabinoid receptors. For the people whose defensive wall is strong enough, it will stop all perpetrators attempting to infiltrate your brain. But this wall isn't regeneratable, so if the micro-missiles fail to get you fried at first, the next time they'll have an easier time against your already damaged wall of defense. Now I bet you're thinking to yourself, this mofo been smoking too much of that Einstein pack. And to you, I say maybe, but also, I have practical proof of this theory. I used to be a pro baller, and one day, me and a couple Hooper friends who all have great immune systems and therefore probably good za defensive walls decided to smoke up, and to my buddies, it was their first time. Once we lit the J and passed it around, I made sure to tell everybody to inhale the smoke in their lungs, which I'm pretty sure they all did, but still, I was the only one who got high, cause it wasn't my first time. But when I smoked up with some of my 
non-athlete first-timer friends, they all got high like normal. So, conclusion, defensive saw wall is a real thing and I stand by my theory. Anyway, although that was my first time feeling high, I wouldn't call it my first high because it only lasted for half a minute. My first real high experience was something even more memorable and etched to my brain until I die. A couple weeks after the last incident, me and Rizx decided it was about damn time I actually felt the true love and touch of the Mary Jane. And this time, instead of having only scraps of Za, we bought a whole gram to hopefully destroy my highly speculative Za wall. I think it's real. Also, at this time, we were obsessed with freestyle rapping, so we decided the plan of action was to smoke up, eat candy, and rap battle to copyright free beats while recording it so we could listen to our unreleased tracks in the morning. Since our parents were away for the night, we got the whole apartment to ourselves and planned on rolling two J's, both containing 0.5 G's. But we had this old ass plastic grinder which as we were grinding the teeth broke so we had to use the good old scissors in a cup method which this would have never happened if we had instead one of the metal CBD bro grinders. Since we were petrified at the thought of getting caught blazing, instead of being sensible and smoking the J's near a window and just blowing the smoke out, we put our jackets on and walked 500 feet away from the apartment to light up. Just to be sure that there wouldn't even be a microfiber of evidence that we were smoking the devil's lettuce. As we were consuming the J, all I could hope for was that this time I wouldn't just get a limited free trial, but the actual full version. But alas, when we finished puffing the J, I again felt nothing, or at least that's what I thought, cause as we arrived back home, I finally realized that- So you feeling it? <laughs> Yeah, kinda. Sometimes the high hits you a couple minutes later, especially if you're going from outdoors to indoors as we did. And my highly accepted theory in the science community about this phenomenon is that through evolution, we have always considered indoors to be our safe zone and outdoors dangerous. Therefore, when you're outside, your brain doesn't allow the full faded and relaxed effect to take over, probably in anticipation of a roadman coming and chefing you up with the mandem. Okay, okay, this one I'm not not so confident in, and I have to come clean, I am in no shape or form associated with the science community. Yet. Anyway, now that we were high and in the living room, we started putting on some beats and freestyling, and to this day, I have yet to replicate the skill and precision of my flow that high. It's hard to explain, but nowadays, I can't rap for shit. I mean, I'll spit one line and be like, yo, I've been getting money making racks, cause you know I flip them packs. That's facts. Yeah, 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 that's it. Basically, I run out of rhymes pretty fast, but that day, I did not. In fact, even when my brain had nothing to say, my mouth wrapped it for me. I turned into a freestyling robot and became dead sure that I was gonna make it out by dropping a mixtape and becoming a famous rapper. Until we listened to the recording in the morning and realized... Yo, flowing on the go, your girl she a hoe, making money dancing with a pole, my girl making dough while doing lines of blow, cause we in the penthouse baby, living life, and that's for show. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try YouTube instead. Zaza addiction. A bit of a controversial topic as there is a lot of brass NPCs who at the mere mention of the words weed and addiction get aggroed on some oblivion guard shit and start defending the magic Scum. green plant like some 11th century crusaders. Scum. And to be honest, there is some merit to this as it is true you can't get addicted to Zaza like nicotine for example, but that doesn't mean the Za is completely safe. Exo Zero made a great video on the topic which inspired me to make this, but I thought I'd look at it at a bit of a different angle cause from my experience your relationship with the Mary Jane is truly a personal one. You can have a dude who smokes up 24-7 every day and because of it is a depressed mofo who doesn't get nothing done and just sits on his bed contemplating about why he is sad all the time. But then you can have a dude like Snoop Dogg who literally breeds THC instead of O2 yet has accomplished more with his life than most of us can ever dream of. For real though, dudes is just completing side quests at this point. Anyway, let's go ahead and look at different types of people and why they smoke the za and how it affects them. Starting with the faded subway worker. Now, this ain't the subway worker specifically. It can be anybody who has a job where they have discovered that being baked during it makes it a lot more bearable and fun. It's just that in my experience, the workers at subway are usually always baked. At least that's what it seems like to me. To people like this, the Zaza has become less of a fun plant that you smoke when you have free time to instead the cup of coffee you have in the morning. And well, because people like this literally rely on the Zaza to get through the day, their relationship 
relationship with it isn't usually very healthy. These also the types of dudes if you ever smoke up with will annihilate the whole spliff and dent some and after they'll be looking and acting the exact same way like they ain't just smoke a chief keef sized fatty. A dude like this is usually stuck in a loop but wanting to be happy and maybe quit their job but then as soon as they wake up and smoke a spliff push their aspirations to the side for just one more day but then they do it the next day and the next day and so on. So although dudes might not be physically addicted to the za he is mentally using it to forget about his problems for the day kind of like an alcoholic or something. Then again it might also be man just enjoys working well high and after getting home doesn't even smoke anymore and just does what makes him happy. As I said it's all about why you use the za to figure out if your relationship with it is healthy or not. Cause this next dude definitely doesn't use it to forget about his problems and he is the creative dude or artist. I think one thing we can all agree on whether you think the za is addictive or not is that when you high you tend to be more creative. Now that doesn't mean that's automatically a good thing cause a lot of times that creativity just means thinking about something very deeply and never actually taking it any further than that. For real though sometimes I'll be smoking up and I'll be turned into a Greek philosopher out here contemplating the very fabric of the universe. And if you're an artist of any sort and you can actually take these high thoughts and express them through something real you can see where smoking up every day can become not such a bad thing. Obviously your lungs will still feel the damage but compared to the last dude on the list who on top of that suffers from a lack of motivation and low key depression this dude is not that bad off. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows either as za laziness or zaziness is still a real problem. Although I'm not an artist and just make youtube videos I often do them while hot so I can confidently say sometimes when I get a great idea and try to bring it to reality and it doesn't turn out how I imagined it I get kind of demotivated and just give up for a while. And when I'm not baked I might not feel as confident and excited about my ideas but regardless I still finish them and do what I gotta do. But with the za it can make me overanalyze things quite a bit to the point I might think myself out of a solid thought or plan. But I'm guessing not everyone has this debuff cause I mean you look at a mofo like Snoop Dogg and it'll get you second guessing if smoking grass is the key to success. It's probably not. Really, anyway, nigga. next dude on the list who smokes every day and is low key addicted is the grass NPC. This guy is, in my opinion, the worst type of Zaza addict. Because in this dude's head, no matter how much grass you consume and however much it affects your daily life, it doesn't matter. Because, well, the Zaza isn't addictive. The grass NPC also made an appearance on my The Worst Types of Grass Smokers video because of his blatant ignorance and constant defensiveness towards the magic green plant. If you ever talk to this guy you better be super careful about bringing up any negative towards the za because this dude will argue his life away defending his one and only love the Mary Jane. Even though it always makes me happy when famous celebrities or athletes like Kevin Durant for example talk about the grass and how it has had a positive impact on their life because it shows that just because you like getting high doesn't automatically mean you're a lazy good for nothing stoner. But if the lazy stoner is the one trying to preach the gospel of the Mary Mary Jane, then who in her right mind is gonna be like, yeah, this guy's spitting straight facts. He really got his shit together. Point being, if you smoke up 24 7 and have a low key sa addiction, own up to it and admit you got a bit of a problem instead of trying to justify your dependency on some. <sighs> <coughs> Bro, that's like your fifth spliff. You sure that's a good idea? <laughs> what you mean? This shit all organic. <coughs> It ain't even bad for you, bro. I mean, smoking anything is bad, especially if you're doing it 24 7. <laughs> nah, bro, so I ain't even a drug. <laughs> you really should do your research. Here, I, I sent you an article about the positives of smoking grass. Uh, okay. Uh, What's this? What you sent me? Uh, it's just some research talking about all the negatives of smoking grass. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. I can't hear you. This gas is too loud. <laughs> <laughs> My man doesn't want to hear it, which is really bad cause being ignorant to the negative side effects of the za can lead to way too much consumption which can evolve to a dependency on it just to live your everyday life. For real though, if you don't ever give your body time to filter out that grass from your system, it's gonna get used to it always being there which will lead you to experiencing things like loss of appetite, low mood, low energy etc when off the za. So especially to all my younger viewers, don't think of the grass as some magical perfect substance, there are constant 
consequences to using it, just like everything else in the world. Sometimes even when I have one mega smoke sesh, I'll feel the after effects in the morning, like a ZA hangover. It's all about moderation and using the ZA to enhance your life and the experiences you have, not relying on it for them. I've also said this in one of my previous videos, but I think it fits well here too. It's not about how high you were, it's about where you were high. So yeah, always try to keep that in mind types of people you should never blaze with. If you've ever smoked with friends, you know being high with others can be a great time and in a lot of ways much more fun than being high alone. But it can also be awful and cause za anxiety if you're with the wrong group. So today we're gonna go over types of people you should never smoke up with. Starting with the over smoker. The over smoker is someone who wants to hit that Benjamin way too much. Now don't get me wrong, I got nothing against a good old limit breaker sesh, but if you're the over smoker, you never actually doing that. Cause your tolerance is so high, even if you grab the beehive sized chunk of wax and dab the whole thing, you still stand there like, phew, I, I think I feel something. Another reason I really don't like blazing with these dudes is cause you can't ever really dive into a topic and enjoy the high, cause every 10 minutes you hear that, hey, let's do another hit. Like what you mean dog? we just did 3 hits in 30 minutes, I'm halfway fused with the couch and your homie is in the corner explaining how the government controls us with tap water, we don't need another hit bro. One positive this guy has I guess though, is he is always equipped with a ridiculous amount of za, dudes must get his shit from the same guy Gordon Ramsay was hitting up cause it's always some damn exotic. Even so, their vibe ain't really one I fuck with, so if you're this guy, I'ma respectfully advise you to maybe consider taking a tea break or some, cause their diff is a point where it's too much. Unlike the next guy, who doesn't even need any side to be annoying, and he is Mr. Paranoid. I think we've all gotten paranoid from the grass before, and that ain't nothing to be ashamed of, cause sometimes there really ain't nothing you can do, but the occasional paranoid episode ain't what this guy has. This dude, even before taking a rip, is talking about some, hey, hey yo, you, you sure this ain't lace? right no what this is the same stuff as last time bro uh, okay 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 that's good um can you can you check if there's any cops around bro there's no cops we're in the fucking woods yeah okay but wait, wait before we smoke uh, let's let me check if this place is haunted Like, bro, what do you mean haunted? This ain't conjuring, bro. Why are you always trying to set a negative vibe for everyone? But however much you assure my mans that no, it's okay. We're not about to be swatted on some Twitch streamer shit. His mind just can't seem to get over it. And worst part is, dude never tries to deal with his paranoid problems on his own. You can all be having a fun time talking about some GTA 6 leaks or something, and he'll just ruin it all with, Hey, yo, guys. You hear that? Hear what? Bro, I swear. I just heard someone walking outside. So? It, it's a neighborhood. That's, that's what people do. Yeah, but the window's open. He could have saw us all high. <laughs> yeah, but it ain't like you're gonna call the cops. Cops? Th there's cops? What? No, chill, man. There's no cops. Nah, nah, bro. I think I'm greening out. I need some fresh air or something. <laughs> bro just decides, yup. I'm greening out now. Like no, your personality is just very insecure and you should probably get that figured out before you take another smack dabbly do off that Benjamin. Anyway, this guy ain't no fun to blaze with cause he's very prone to ruining the vibe so avoid at all costs. Uh, this next guy is more of a personal preference so you might disagree with me but for a guy I don't like getting high with is the grass NPC. I think we've all met one of these whether you knew it at the time or not. This is the type of dude who lives, breathes and of course smokes grass. I mean really, dudes physically can't talk about anything else for more than a minute cause he has no goals or aspirations that stretch further than I wanna get sued at AF. Which wanting to get sued at ain't nothing bad, I mean most of us here probably love bacon, but come on bro, at some point you gotta think about your life, your future, or I don't know, just something else than grass. Why I personally don't like hanging with a dude like this is cause his stories always are so centered around how high he was. I mean bro, I get it, you went to school high, like at some point after hearing about the 78th time of dudes being high in class, you start to notice that man's actually has nothing interesting to say except yeah I was so gone when I was in math class yeah bro we went to the zoo and I was not on planet earth <laughs> like bro when are you ever on planet earth and I find it hard to believe this guy cuz if you blaze in so much do you even feel high anymore like don't you just get used to the feeling and it becomes normal anyway yeah, don't be this guy he ain't making it past level one of life for real unless he like starts his own dispensary or something then it could work out very nicely actually. But the next type of dude on the list is the guy that wants to be taken way too serious. I don't know if you guys ever talked to someone like this, but I have a couple times and it's annoying AF. 
You know how when you blaze, you tend to go on rants and halfway lose your train of thought and then just end up saying, ah oh, shit, I don't know what I'm talking about. And everyone laughs and moves on? Well, this dude is incapable of doing that. Instead, he holds the conversation hostage with his ramblings about inflation, Biden, Oprah, and James Cameron. And if you start trying to move on and talk about something else, dude sits there not listening and then three minutes later hits everyone with the, okay, okay, so basically what I was trying to explain earlier was, like bro, we already moved on and we're all freaking baked. No one even remembers their last sense. How are you gonna start expanding on your thoughts from ages ago like the MCU or something. Worst part is, however much you try to politely show him to stop ranting, he never gets the sign to just keeps doing it. Best thing you can do is just not invite him to the sesh, and you don't have to feel like a dick about it either, cause I'm 100% sure he understands the signs, but just ignores him cause he thinks his thoughts are more important than whatever the group wants to talk about. But the next dude on the list has a bit of a different problem, and he is Mr. I'm bored, I wanna do something. Oh snap, the guy who is somehow always bored and wants to do something. Now, don't get me wrong, I love high adventures and I'm always down to go on one, but only if there's actually something cool in mind. Yeah, this is something this dude and me don't have in common, cause this mofo just spams the sense, Ugh, I'm bored, let's go somewhere. Like bro, where somewhere? Say where. My man just assumes anywhere is better than where he is, and honestly, that gets annoying fast cause it makes you all self-conscious about if you're bored or not. And honestly, a lot of times you might be, but that's just life, the grass ain't a freaking happy pill, sometimes you're gonna smoke up and still feel bored. But how is that gonna change if we go outside? It's not like we living in Skyrim, bro. However sad it may be, you ain't finna open the door and see a mysterious bearded man waiting for you with a scroll in his hand saying, Adventurer, we need you. But hey, out of everybody on the list, I think this guy is the least bad, cause a lot of times the Zom makes mofos lazy AF, so it is good to have someone who can push the group into doing stuff, just sometimes my man needs to chill out. Talking about, let's go to McDonald's, let's go to Burger King, let's go shh 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 shh. Let's just shut the fuck up, okay? Although sometimes dude actually does have something in mind, which turns out to be pretty fun. So there ain't nothing bad with wanting to do something cool, just you don't have to parade the fact you're bored all the time. Cause just by saying that, everybody is gonna feel like that even more. The plug, a holy being that will always be there for you, especially when you don't need him, and also occasionally when you do. And because I don't live in the fancy America, where all the big vloggers and tiktokers are, I still rely on the plug for my Zaza. But after years of buying from different plugs, I always wondered how much money do these guys actually make and what are the requirements to be successful in the profession. Well, finally, after the introduction of a new, scientifically enhanced type of grass, HHC, I kinda got the answer to these questions. And I'ma be honest with you, it ain't what I expected. As I said before, it all started with the introduction of the so-called new and improved ZA, HHC. And because it was new and regulations had not been set, even in my stone age country where an 18 year old can buy a liter of vodka and drink himself to death, or just get hammered and get the sudden urge to call out the 6 foot 5 undefeated heavyweight MMA fighter at the club because, well, when he sees red, body start dropping. Anyway, since this was legal and I am a law abiding citizen who wouldn't even dare to jaywalk, I thought to myself, this is the perfect moment to see what being the plug is all about. Furthermore, because most dudes in this country don't know anything about strains, hash, bud, and just take whatever the plug has, I didn't need to worry about people thinking I scammed them. Also, your boy conducted a thorough inspection of this new product, using only the most delicate and scientific tools possible. Oh, okay, I hit that shit through a Red Bull canning. It kicked pretty nicely, so I dubbed it Verified Lab. After securing half an ounce of the Verified Lab, which is 14 grams in European tongue, I went to work on finding customers. And obviously the best place to start is on Snapchat. So I took a picture of the Zaza with the caption, 15 bucks per gram, hit me up. Which is a steal, because, well, it sold for 20 a G here. And unfortunately, I only got one sale, because I guess most of the people who I knew smoke very like loud. Were plugs themselves, and knew of the existence of HHC, and that it's like 6 bucks a gram. But, I was still determined to flip them packs and make them racks. So, I hit up the most trustworthy plug I knew, who actually had people in his contacts, who smoked verified lab, but we're not in the business of trapping themselves. After a thorough business meeting where we may or may not have smoked the grass ourselves, he conducted that the gas I had was indeed worthy of the title verified lab, and offered to buy it all for 12 bucks a gram, which I mean, I got it for 8.5, so I obviously said yes. At first I thought that was all, I made a nice profit of about 40 bucks and was feeling good. 
But after about two days, I got a message from the plug I conducted business with reading, Bro, that shit sold out quick. Can you order more? I think I can actually sell this stuff for 25 a G, cause people want the same stuff real bad. Now I think you are currently pondering two questions. Why didn't he just order more himself? And how the hell did these dudes not know it was HHC? Well, the reason he didn't order more himself is quite simple. He is a full time OG plug, so dudes does not have a bank account to order stuff. And to answer the second question, I truly don't know. I couldn't really believe it myself, but I guess most owners really don't give a fuh about news and staying up to date with it. In the words of the great plug himself, these dudes just wanna get as f***ed up as possible. They don't know nothing about no THC, HHC, CBD, BBC, NBA, MMA, nothing. Anyway, it all sounds great, right? Everybody loves the verified lab and are willing to pay premium for it. Plus, it's all technically legal and I don't even need to sell it myself. Well, it would have been, but there were two problems that made it a bit more sketch. You see, the issue with HHC is that it's a chemically produced product. All it actually is, is THC with a couple extra hydrogen molecules. And through thorough research, both practical and scientifical, I found out that HHC is very unstable in nature, meaning one patch of the same strain can truly be verified lab. But then the next patch made with the exact same ZA and same way could be some whack leftover Reggie. It's because it's very hard to control how well this hydrogen molecule molecule binds to the THC and not financially worth it to control the potency of each patch. So you could order that shit once and get some damn moon rock or like the first experience I had with HHC, get some damn oregano. And the second problem was the plug I was conducting business with didn't want that risk all to himself so I would have to cover the upfront costs of the HHC and then give it to him where he would hopefully flip it for 25 bucks a G which I would receive 15 bucks a G and him 10. So here I was with quite the pickle of a conundrum. Should I order a whole ounce of HHC? Which by buying an ounce you get the best price per gram but I risk it being whack Reggie. Or should I just order a fourth, therefore lowering the risk of getting whack product, but also lowering the profit margins? And the conclusion I arrived at was the best of both worlds. I ordered half an ounce just like before. After receiving the good good, I gave half of it to the trustworthy OG plug and waited for that passive income to roll in. But unfortunately, it was as I feared. The stuff I got this time was still good and solid, but it just wasn't the verified loud I received before. So the OG plug was having trouble marketing it as premium za and lowered the price to the industry standard 20 bucks a g but unfortunately dudes were catching on as well and some of them refused to buy the za because they could just order it online like yeah you can but wouldn't you rather buy from your friendly neighborhood plug i guess not because after a couple days the og plug sent me another message yo this stuff ain't moving like before and people catching on about the origins i have half of the stuff left if you want i'll buy it out for 10 bucks a g or just return it to you. Which I hesitantly chose the first option, so I had him just buy it out. Yet there was still the issue of the 7 G's or so I had left, which I initially planned on flipping, but was unfortunately unable to cause mofos knew I got that shit for pennies compared to the asking price. So I did as all plugs would do and dubbed the leftover HHC as my personal stash and just started blazing my own product, which was kind of stupid in hindsight because a couple weeks after, HHC was illegalized, as we all knew it would be, and became a rarity in the ZA industry. Which mofo started flipping that shit for 30 bucks a G, like goddamn, it, it ain't even that different from normal ZA. Anyway, by the end of it all, I made a bit under $100 in profit, or in another metric, about 10 Gs of ZA which I smoked myself, so really the conclusion to my plugging experience was I got free grass, which was a bit underwhelming cause I was hoping to become the local Pablo Escobar if you know what I mean. Moral of the story is don't get high off your own supply, or at least if you wanna be a businessman. Oh and also don't sell illegal things, cause well this HHC was legal so I could have technically flipped it on Facebook marketplace or something. Buying from the plug is always an experience, cause unless you're super tight with him you never know if you're gonna get the leftover oregano Reggie pack he scraped from the bottom of his grinder or if you lucky and the RNG got smile upon you you might just get the finest organic grass fed grass there is on planet earth. But alas, most plugs keep that quality stuff for only the loyalist of customers or new buyers, for me it was the latter. 
It begins with me and the main homie Salamander. We had just gotten home from school on a Friday and had scraped our money together for a night of hitting the Spliffington and playing video games. Now usually it was Salamander who secured the bag cause I didn't really have too many connects. Unfortunately this time he was unable to find the holy saw from his usual catalog of plugs. But we didn't let that discourage us cause we knew if there is a will there is a way. So both me and Salamander started hitting up everybody we knew who dabbled with the powers of the green plant and it wasn't looking too good. Altogether, we wrote about 10 people, half of which just ignored us and the other half just said they were out. So as we sat there on the couch, hope dwindling, sadness emerging and worst of all, no Zaza approaching. We were about to call it a day when one of the dudes who had initially ignored us sent out a beacon of light. Yeah, I know a guy. He just started plugging so I can't vouch for the quality, but he definitely got some. Now, if you've ever been in a situation like this, you know it is one of the best feelings in the world when you've almost given up but in the last second you get that holy text of yeah, how much? But even though we were pretty stoked, we were also a little bit very because this $20 we had saved up was the equivalent of 20 million in today's money. And because this guy was new and no info was given on the quality, we were scared of getting a bag of oregano. And I mean, at the time, we both thought all plugs are grueling gangsters ready to kill you on sight if you so much as make the wrong sound. So if it really was a bag of oregano, there was nothing we could do about it. Anyway, the time comes for us to meet up with this mysterious plug and the instructions he gave us were to come to this rundown gas station's loading area in the back at 8 p.m. sharp so we did as we were standing there at 7 58 p.m. we could only imagine what vicious heinous devious killer would come to greet us so yeah, we hyped him up a little too much, but all that mattered now was the grass and if it was good or not. We went through the usual plug dialogue options like, Yo, what's up? Yeah, bro, can't wait to get suited today. Is that good, good, etc. Until he finally revealed the grass and what I witnessed to this day I find absurd. The grass was golden. Nani? Not in like shiny gold, but it was this yellowish color with green accents. Beautiful. And the smell. Bro opened that bag up for us to sniff, but it was not necessary, as the smallest opening in that Ziploc baggie consumed the entire area with the finest fragrance imaginable. Oh, okay, well, finest is the wrong word, probably. The shit smelled like cat piss, but that's a good thing with Saza. So we gave up our $20 with no hesitation and returned to Salamander's place with this golden grass of the gods. Now, usually, we would just roll up a spliff and consume the za like that. But as this seemed to be legendary material, and we didn't want to waste even a single microgram, we made a makeshift can that would allow us to ration this gram to the maximum. So, now it was time to hit the za, and it went something like this. Are you ready? She, you know it. Here goes nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you good, bro? Uh, yeah, you, you gotta hit this shit, man. Hey, hey you good? You, you good, bro? You hear me? You good? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, man, this is some good stuff. This shit was heavenly. It was not of this world, I swear. Now, I'm not sure if it was because our tolerance was pretty much zero at the time, or it was really grass descendant from heaven. Probably a mix of both. But one thing I do know, that was the highest I had ever been up until that point. And well, as we know, when you were really, really high, you don't remember much the night after. So unfortunately, I don't know exactly what we talked about or what we did, but I do remember that we caught a major case of the Joker's laughing gas because we found everything hilarious. We were so goddamn high, it took us a solid 20 minutes to navigate the PS4 menu to launch our game of Call of Duty. And when we did launch it, we were cognitively impaired. Felt like the controller was inverted or some shit. But safe to say, that Friday night we were truly blessed by the plug. And we went on to exclusively buy from that guy until he stopped plugging one month later. But he will always hold a special place in my heart as the plug of plugs. The first eye. I think most of us remember our first time inhaling the Zaza. Cause for the unlucky few who got hit with that paranoid pack and started bugging out like that Szechuan sauce dude at McDonald's, 
they probably wrote off the grass as an unholy manifestation of the bull himself. For me, my first sight was a truly enlightening moment, as I ain't no dum dum, so I took the proper pre precautions to ensure I wasn't gonna be laying on the bed having down flashbacks because my mom came home and wanted me to do some chores or something. But anyway, the first time high experience is different for everybody, but it always starts with the securing of the bag. Now, depending on how old you were and where you live, this part of the first high was either the easiest or the most stressful, because nowadays mofos can go to a damn tree and acquire the holiest and strongest grass in the universe like a damn candy bar, but back in the wild west, you had to deal with these dudes called plugs, and if you were just a normal kid buying an illegal item from some dude named Spider, it was really scary. Like me and my homies always imagined they'd be all tattooed up, packing heat in every pocket, looking like Mike Tyson when he got out of jail. In reality, they were usually just normal dudes trying to make a quick buck. And also, now that I'm older, I've kind of realized all these plugs with tattoos and nicknames like Scorpion or some shit were literally just wannabe thugs who just listened to a bit too much UK drill and made it their whole personality overnight. But anyway, once you secured the bag, you had to move on to setting the time and place. Now, if you had a friend with his own crib or with parents who frequently left the house unattended, this was easy, but if not, well, that's where a lot of these bad trips happened. Mofos were fiending to get high so bad, a lot of them decided, f*** it, let's just get high at school, or something crazy like that. And let me tell you, you gotta mentally be god David Goggins if you get high for the first time at school and don't start tweaking. Even after I had to up a good amount, I still didn't consider getting high at school a chill experience. It was a mission every single time. Like, however calm you thought you were, all it took was one. Uh, Mr. C, can you tell me the answer to question 14, please? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, question 14, uh, well, the answer. Excuse me, Mr. C, are you on something? Well, shit. Juvie it is, I guess. But hey, I do know dudes who did this for their first and survived. And big props to them, just couldn't be me. And I don't recommend it be you either. Another popular option, which was kind of in the middle, was just getting faded outside at the park on a weekend or something. This was much more chill, but the problem of randoms walking around and the fear of getting an unexpected call from your parents or something was still quite prevalent. Also, another downside, coma is quite easily catchable. So if you puffed on that za for too long, you might have gotten a bad trip because you got glued to the park bench. Speaking of puffing for too long, choosing the amount. Last part, but arguably the most important, is obviously choosing the size of the portion. Now, depending on your friends and if they were heads or not, they could have told you anything from yeah man, so uh, a good first sit is uh, this entire one gram lift. Uh, inhale it all and uh, you should feel something. To so yeah, this molecule should be enough for your first time. It's, 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 it's got a good amount of atoms in it. In reality, it's somewhere in the middle, cause being it's your first time, your tolerance doesn't exist yet, so even smelling some premium wood might have gotten you high. Then again, if the stuff wasn't premium, you might have been left disappointed at barely feeling anything and writing it off as yeah, I'm just built different, I guess. It don't work on me. And actually, for some reason, a lot of dudes don't feel anything their first time, including me. I always imagined there being some wall of defense in my body, and with every hit, it got weaker, until finally it broke and opened the floodgates for the green magic to flow through. But there is a final step that a lot of people forget to do, and that is enjoying the high. So yeah, don't try to control it, flow with it. You get me? Especially if you alone. And also, my first time was alone. Edibles, part of the holy trinity when it comes to getting as faded as humanly possible. And the reason they are so potent is that in the act of cooking the za, the TAC transforms into something beyond its normal powers and becomes Super Saiyan Za. Or 11 Hydroxy TAC. But let's stick to Super Saiyan because that other name isn't really cool. Anyway, if you're an OG subscriber, you know my first time doing edibles was quite a crazy experience, but I wouldn't call it anything else than, yeah, I was really really freaking high. But this time, the abominations we made were no mere first timer dose, we threw everything we had in there. The day started like any other, except I had just gotten back from Barcelona the previous night and was a bit tired, but you see, there was this really cool movie in the cinema called Bar Oppenheimer. 
Anyway, me and Rizix had planned to watch Oppenheimer in the cinema sometime before August, but being us, we obviously wanted to be baked during this time, and well, the movie was 3 hours long, so just a quick hit wasn't gonna cut it. So we decided on something we hadn't done in years, that obviously being edits. The only problem was, we don't know how to manage time, and well, once we started actually making the things, the movie had already begun, but although I do love Killian Murphy, let's be honest, the main part of this journey was the edible not Oppenheimer. So we were like, uh, screw it, we only gonna miss like the first 30 minutes. Which if we had actually read some reviews on the movie, we would have known it's not something you go to 30 minutes late while bugging up the Zaza and the world's strongest edible. Yeah, we also just for safe measures smoked a bit before too. But anyway, once we made our abominations and the whole house was smelling like Snoop Dogg's beard, we sat down to eat these deep fried to get you deeply fried cookies. Ready? Ready. Bro, they're, they're so dry, man. Yeah, so they were awful in the taste department, but in the how messed up they gonna get you apartment, well, you'll find out soon enough. As I said earlier, just for safety, in case they were duds, we also smoked up a bit before, and we're feeling like medium sized, cooled on the kitchen counter pizza rolls, even before the cookies hit. As we arrived in the cinema, we were, well, a little bit scared, but also excited to find out what these monstrous things were going to do to us, because, well, we hadn't done edibles in ages, and knew our tolerance towards them was zero. After buying popcorn and a medium drink, we walked in the cinema, took our seats, and sat down to watch the movie, which had been going on for 40 minutes at that point, but we thought we could still enjoy it, and we did until... <laughs> Bro, I could not stop laughing, and that's when I knew the edibles had hit. Now, up until this point, I consider myself a man of pure willpower and mental fortitude, and that there's no way some green plant was gonna get me bugging. And for the first 30 minutes after feeling them hit, it was true, until I got the ultimate disability the Za can curse you with. I'm talking of course about manual breathing. I was sat in that cinema like a full on tweaker, and bro, it did not feel good. Like, however hard I tried to destroy the Super Saiyan saw with my mind, I just couldn't. And Riz X was low-key tweaking too, plus the movie, well, it was kinda shit. And before you roast me in the comments, I think Oppenheimer is a great movie. Just arriving 40 minutes late and bugging off Super Saiyan Za wasn't the best idea for a story-focused film. So, we decided to get the fuck out of there. And bro, I don't even know how to describe what I felt and saw once we opened the gates to the outside world. Bro, I was feeling like my senses were turned up to 10,000% overdrive. And bro, I'ma be honest, I was not seeing straight. So although we drove to the cinema, we were in no shape to drive back, so we just started paddling our demon eyes looking butts home. Until at some point, we found some e-scooters, so we ran a dose and just started blasting our way. And what an amazing time that was, like every switch of scenery felt like a brand new biome. Like at some point, we took a little detour through a park, and bro, we felt like we was in a damn jungle. Like even the slight rumble and turbulence we got from the road made it feel like we were true explorers on not e-scooters but one of those safari exploring buggies riding through unexplored wildlands. But anyway, once we got back home, I decided to look in the mirror to see if I looked as high as I felt. And well, I looked more high. Like, I didn't even know your eyes can get that red. But there they were, looking like the eyes of the damn devil himself. Speaking of getting high AF, we doing a smoke sesh on the Discord on Sunday, where it's mine and your job to get absolutely bedazzled belazzled and just chill the fuck out. Anyway, link for the disc will be in the pinned comment, so make sure you join and pull up on the sesh. Anyway, back to me looking in the mirror. As I looked in the mirror and saw nothing but an empty vessel wandering the wrong plane of existence staring back, I got a bit frying, cause man I swear, my reflection was not moving in sync with me yet again, but this time it was even worse, cause I was like 4 times higher than I was when I first did edibles. So what happened next you might be wondering, I was bugging out looking like an uncooked steak and I couldn't focus on anything longer than 1 second, well, I went to sleep. 
Cause one good thing I will say about the trip, the comfortability I felt in my bed was unlike anything I've ever felt before. My blanket was just the perfect temperature, my mattress the perfect fit, and my pillow the perfect place to lay your head. And because of that, and I'm not exaggerating on this, the very second I closed my eyes, I was asleep. Well, not like deep sleep, but nap sleep. Anyway, after closing my eyes, in about 3 minutes, I was completely knocked out. And well, I slept so much like a baby, I actually believe the ZA manipulated my very core and reverted my cells and body shape to that of when I was 3 months old, to enable me to get the full experience of sleeping like a baby. Only problem was though, as I woke up like literally 10 hours later, I was still high AF. Not like can't see straight high, but like just hit the BONG high. To be honest, I was just amazed, cause I knew if we had smoked that amount of za we put in the cookies, we might have been really lit, but nothing like we were from the cookies. And after that day, I have now learned my lesson, that actual strong edibles are more comparable to mushrooms than normal bud. But Greening out or getting too high is the worst thing that can happen when inhaling that freshly cut grass. If you have a sudden emergency or miscalculate the size of the portion, things can turn south real quick. One moment, you're chilling in your room having the time of your life playing Minecraft or some shit. Next thing you know, the green forcefully teleports your brain into a realm filled with the demons of your nightmares. And once the grass pushes you over that border, it ain't no easy task to get back to Yodi land. But not to worry, for D who masters the green out, masters the universe. Uh, okay, well, well, that's kind of an overstatement, but but nah, for real. If you want to learn how to never green out again, then you're in the right place. Because being that I do have a PhD in spliff rolling, a master's degree in avoiding bad trips, and a bachelor's in high thoughts... I am more than qualified to teach you the ways of the za. First things first, what are the symptoms of feeling too high? Well, the Cambridge Dictionary describes greening out as <clears throat> Greening out is a term described as being so goddamn high that you start tweaking like a schizophrenic that hasn't taken his pills for a week. The symptoms of this state include dry mouth, anxiety, paranoia, thinking of that one time you should have done that one thing a little bit differently, etc. As we can see, greening out is obviously not a pleasurable experience, and to know how to counteract this phenomenon, we must analyze the three main types of green outs. Number 1. The pure Kush coma green out. Starting with the good old Kush coma. Being one of the most commonly occurring green outs, it can be caused by many factors like overestimating your tolerance, smoking an unexpectedly strong strain, or the one I have seen the most, not correctly gauging the situation and how much fadedness it requires slash allows. So let's say you're gonna be going over to a small little function with a couple of your buddies. Now if the goal of said function isn't to all unifiedly test the boundaries of high, then I wouldn't recommend hogging the spliff in the rotation for too long cause you best believe when everyone is chatting and having a good time and you're just laying on the couch like a sloth, you'll be wishing that you were a little bit more generous in the prior rotation. Plus the guy who falls asleep first is always the one who gets clowned on so you probably don't want to be him. And if you've never been in a kush coma, I think a quote from one of the most beautiful works of artistic creation in the 21st century sums it up best. <coughs> Now, this is the traditional paranoid green out. It can be triggered pretty much whenever. I mean, really, sometimes the green holy plant just feels like messing with you and decides to do something like this. <sighs> oh boy, I'm excited. Can't wait to just lay down and have a good old time. A few moments later. Hey, remember that cursed movie you watched as a kid? <laughs> yeah, that was stupid. Yeah, <laughs> it was. But you're enjoying this Saza too much lately, so I'm just gonna make your brain think that it was real so you get real spooked and can't sleep all night. That cool? What? N no! Okay, bye. <laughs> So, as you can see, these are kind of the worst, as there's no real counter for when the grass decides to screw with you. The only thing that can at least help prevent this from happening is your experience as a blazer, cause at some point, you get used to the occasional mind tricks of the ZA. 
Anyway, let's move on to the last and rarest one. Number 3. The Situational Greenout. Even though this one doesn't happen often because most people who decide to get faded into Universe 7 plan out a safe area where they can enjoy the grass in comfort. All that being said, however well you plan, there is always the chance of an urgent mission popping up. And I mean, what can you really do when, I don't know, your homie's about to be jumped by a ragtag bunch of 13 year old UK <laughs> roadmen? The only correct answer is you gotta get your baked ass up from that couch you've melded with, pull up on the situation and handle it like a man. Uh, could you guys stop calling my friend the waste man, whatever that means? Man, shut up, blood, before you get chinged by the mandem, plotty waste man in it. What, I, I don't, I, I'm not a waste man, okay? And I can see we're not getting anywhere, so, so I'm gonna go now. Ching him up. Okay, well, you're probably not gonna be in situations exactly like that, but you get what I mean. Now that we've learned about all the types of green outs, how do we counteract them? Well, if I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I don't have that master's degree in avoiding bad trips, although the split rolling one was not a lie, and therefore I did nothing wrong. By Prime Energy. But it's rather simple. To avoid the Kush coma, don't smoke as much Kush. The anxiety green out can easily be avoided with basic strategies, so if you're going to a place filled with new people, it's probably not the best idea to hit that double Benjamin. And the last one, well, can't do nothing about that. Just hope you don't get chinged, I guess. I think we can all agree that the magic broccoli can make you more creative. However, how does that creativity translate outside the realm of Yodi Land is a whole different question. Now, me being the certified scientist, doctor, officer, and more, I've had a lot of sometimes stupid, sometimes brilliant ideas, well, bugging off the zaza. Like this one time when me and my brother were just enjoying a beautiful summer day outside on the terrace, faded AF, when by the gods I was struck with an idea so brilliant and great, I just couldn't stop until it came to fruition. And what was this idea? Well, it went something like this. Oh my. Hey bro, I just got this great idea that I think we should do right now. Uh, okay, wh what is it? <laughs> I got two words for you. Virtual. Reality. And what transpired after this is one of the most sad, stressful, and heartbreaking experiences of my high career. Although my brother was hesitant at first, after I explained why virtual reality will quite literally change our lives forever, he agreed to it. The only problem now was we were broke. Well, not completely, but these damn VR headsets cost anywhere from $400 to $1,000 new. And ain't no way we were about to drop a bag like that on some VR porn. Games, games, I mean, I mean VR games. That's what I was saying. So we did what any other broke 20 year old with a materialistic dream would do. We went on Facebook Marketplace, where after a while of searching, we found an Oculus Rift S being sold for $150 which is a great deal. I mean, it cost 400 new. Plus, it was only 20 miles away, so we could be there in like 20 minutes. So obviously, we went ahead and bought it, without really asking any questions nor looking through the description of the post, which mentioned a cat nibbling on the cord. But hey, what does that have to do with anything? It was f***ing broken, okay? That, that's what it had to do with it. But not in a won't even turn on way of broken. It was like, work for 20 minutes and then doesn't broken. Plus, it didn't even use a normal HDMI cable, so we had to buy a damn $50 adapter for it as well that we haven't used ever since this incident with VR. After like two days of screwing around with the settings and trying to fix the nibbled on cable, we got it to work for the record breaking time of one hour. Yes, one hour of virtual reality. But you know, we spent like 10 hours getting it all set up and fixing the damn errors, plus we dropped $200 on the supplies, so... And, uh, I think it's time I confess my sins right here on the channel. After a week of having the VR headset, we sold it. For a profit. To an unexpecting kid who probably was saving up money for months to get it. <laughs> Sorry. But it's a doggy dog world, and I put in the description the same damn thing. A cat nibbled on the wire. So yeah, I, I think the kid learned a valuable lesson worth more than the $200 he gave me for the broken headset. I mean, the, the VR headset. But it's not all bad, because I've had some pretty banger ideas while high as well. Like this one time when I was inhaling that broccoli and stumbled upon these high stickman channels that were popping up and I thought to myself, wait, hold up, I'm high. I know how to use Microsoft Paint. 
I can do this. And look, it was one of those ideas that you have well high, but it was actually a good idea. Very unlike this one time when me and a couple homies were hotboxing in the car when I came up with the genius plan to go sledding in the middle of winter whilst completely blasted, whilst only having on a hoodie and whilst only having our damn legs for transportation cause the car was just a stationary hotbox machine. So yeah, at the time I don't know what I was thinking, I remember just focusing on the awesome part, you know the whole sledding down the mountain thing. But didn't take into account how cold it was, how much we needed to walk to get up the mountain, how I only had a f***ing hoodie on, plus I forgot about my crippling paranoia about feeling cold. Like literally, my dumbass brain just sometimes flips on me like, Hey, psst. Uh, yeah. So you're having fun? Feeling good? You know, yeah, it's a beautiful day, you know, having a good time. <laughs> yeah, yeah it is. But you're freezing cold, aren't you? No, no what? I'm, I'm not. <laughs> well, now you are. F*** you. Talk to you in your next high. Peace. So yeah, I don't know what I was thinking with that sled-in plan. I was just really hyped about it for no apparent reason, but <laughs> I think that's just a... Like, it makes everything seem awesome. Another weird obsession I seem to have when I'm faded is real Japanese samurai swords. I don't know why, but there's just something about knowing that the sword you are holding was once used for actual combat by a true samurai. But hey, that just might be me. The wake and bake is a legendary art form created by humans of the highest intellect. The act of waking from one slumber and immediately entering into Yodi land is a sacred practice known only to the chillest of creatures. There has been a lot of controversy in the meaning of wake and bake. Some say it can only truly be called the holy practice if one smokes up immediately after awakening from dreamland. Others, including myself, believe it is not necessary to sleep next to your crusty last clean in 2007 smell like a rotting can of tuna ass piece of glass. Cause I don't know about you, but personally I like to start my mornings off with something nice, like a coffee or some bacon and eggs. Not the taste of a water in my mouth whilst coughing my lungs out. I believe a true connoisseur won't partake in such barbaric activities and will at least put some pants on before smoking that doozy. Now if you ever participated in the wake and bake, you will know that it hits differently than let's say an evening bake, but only if you got the whole day free cause the zaza will amplify your excitement for the coming day or until you eat breakfast and pass out on your bed. Back in summer I used to bake after the wake quite a bit, it was always really nice to just go outside to the warm sun while smoking that morning pack. And bro, don't get me started on those breakfast munchies, I'm usually the guy who only drink coffee or something for breakfast, but that early morning grass gets me on that Nikocado avocado pack, I swear. Bro, how much are you going to eat? Everything. And after a delightful breakfast like that, how can you be anything but energized? Nah, in reality, after destroying 2000 calories of Twinkies, you're probably gonna pass out in 20 minutes. But that's why after the first couple times, I created the free golden rules of a productive wake and bake. Number 1. Don't have a demonic ritual that involves you sacrificing 15 hot pockets in your stomach. But, but you just said that the breakfast munchies are nice. Yeah, they are, but you have to treat the massive breakfast kind of like drinking alcohol. So you gotta understand the sacrifice you are making by having that giant breakfast. You are effectively done for the day, as you will most likely fall right back to sleep after, and then when you do wake up from your 3 hour morning nap, you'll feel all hazy and bad. Cause you just wasted your whole day. Lazy piece of shit. So if you wanna avoid that, don't wake in much. Number 2. Make a plan the night before. Have goals set for the day, basic stuff like buy groceries, maybe work out, hang with some friends, stuff like that. Cause when you have a plan the night before, you are much less likely to just sleep the whole day and then at night feel like a lazy fat tub of lard. But also keep in mind, you are supposed to have fun on a wake and bake, so don't make the objectives too hard cause you're probably just not gonna do them then. Some of my favorite wake and bake activities include going to the gym, playing a team sport, playing a story game, bathing in the sun, going to the store, hanging out with the homies, etc. Anyway, time for the last rule which is number 3. Don't get obliterated on the wake and bake. So this one is kinda obvious, but important nonetheless. It might seem like a great idea to get soinked up to on your first hit, but in reality, all that will do is spoil the plans you set the night before. Cause no matter how productive of a smoker you are, when you're faded to the max, there is about a 95% chance you'll tell yourself, ugh, whatever, I'll do it tomorrow. Which once evening rolls around, will hit you with that existential depression. 
And the only way to escape from that is with the purest form of productivity. We've all had it, we all know it. 2 a.m. motivation. The drugs, the cigarettes, that dumb bitch. It all starts fing today, alright? No more fing excuses. That's the fucking. This is the year of the fing soldier. And I mean, even though who doesn't love a bit of midnight motivation, it won't get you anywhere in the long term, and really is usually just a sign of doing nothing useful during the day. But hey, if you follow these three golden rules, I'm sure your future waking bakes will be much more productive and fun. At least I hope so.